787. 787, departure for 1257. 25-7, thanks. Welcome back to Sci-Fi and Friends. I am so sorry for the long hiatus. You know how school gets and going to Disney World and all that kind of crap. And Yeah, but we're back in it. School's over. We'll be hitting it hard. Uh, in fact, I know in the last couple of podcasts you've heard me talk about getting fiber optic internet and you're probably sick and tired of me. When hearing me say when we get it, when we get it, well, we got it just today. The wait is over. The wait is over. So it's hooked up today. <clears throat> and previously, as I was patiently waiting for the internet to be connected, I was in constant email with a few people. Well, email connect uh, communication. I didn't use email. Email's like the old. No, it's not. U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> Casey and I were talking about that the other day. Snapchat made text messages the same way feel the same way that text messages felt made email feel but then we broke down the different communication like what they're best for like you wouldn't i could send you a novel like if i had a novel i could copy and paste it and put in an email you'd have no problem reading it yeah but if i text PDF you file. a novel <laughs> you're not going to ever be able to read it it's not an order right. and you're just like snapchat would be terrible for a novel you know you'd have to i'd have to snap every page you'd be terrible <laughs> this is our conversation just you should night. narrate for 10 seconds to narrate. Yeah. It was not, the best of times. Yeah. It was the worst. Ex exactly. <laughs> exactly. Where did I leave off? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So I was in constant communication with these people who I, were like on my list of people I want to bring on the podcast as far as uh, a comic book uh, illustrator in California. Adam. I'd like to have Adam back on. Oh, dude. Um, it turns out that my grandparents know the owner of Mother's Brewery in Springfield. Like they're really good friends. I was... Just quite a few people, a couple of uh, uh, professors from Pitt State, and it was difficult to get them to come to my house, which is out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, but with this internet, I can Skype them right in, and we'll have high quality audio. So I know I've been wanting to do more in studio stuff with the cameras and everything, and I will, I will as much as I can. If there's actually one guy who's a dream interpreter who lives in like Miami, he's he's amazing. Oh. He'll, he's going to come on with the cameras. And then there's another guy who's a grave digger and a Civil War reenactment guy. He's going to come to studio. And they both requested. I said, we can do it through Skype or we can do the studio. And they both preferred studio. So there will be some guests that do want to come into the studio. But the ones as far as like in California and whatnot, uh, we'll do Skype. And those are set, those, those, um, are set up. They're ready to go. We just need to put a date on them and plan it out. So they're ready to go. So it'll be really cool. So there should be some really cool episodes coming up. But, um, yeah. So welcome back. Today, for the third time. Third time? Third time on the Distinguished Sci-Fi and Friends mm -hmm. podcast. I, I did a BOD cast. Oh, yeah. Podcast. <laughs> and then I was a guest with Tucker on that one. But I've done okay, three yeah. of these bad boys. That was a, actually, that was one of the best episodes. Like, the best feedback that I have got yeah. on those. Oh, people, Tucker? Yeah, people really like that one. Yeah, I, I can't forget the uh, the clown reference. Like a clown <laughs> that can only do, like, make one animal with the balloon. Oh, yeah. yeah. Talking about Tucker with one haircut. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you you laughed and Tucker looked at me like, I thought this was a serious thing. Right. You and I were kind of joking around. Anyway, please welcome my best friend, the fucking wild ass motherfucker. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Please welcome Caleb Clark. I'm gonna have to edit that out. <laughs> no, leave it. <laughs> leave I don't know, it. man. Like, I don't want you to edit any of this they, right well, now. They brought up um, my uncle and my nephew. Is it my nephew? My cousin came down from Baltimore or whatever, and my grandparents were kind of talking about the podcast. Oh like, no! Maybe I should get some more episodes in there so you don't listen to the past episodes. <laughs> You're going to have to put one of those expletive. He's going to make it 10 minutes in and then <laughs> listen to this. <laughs> Who is this guy? That's Colton? Yeah, exactly. Good. Exactly. God. But that's you. That's that's what this podcast is. This Kinda, is you right. being yourself. And like, there's plenty of introspection. There's right, plenty of right. looking out at the current state of pop culture and society and issues and pros and cons and politics and bipartisanship. And then we're slightly comedians in a way because right. we're just having a good time yeah because when trevor and casey and you and jacob and i and everybody talk about that stuff it's always there's always laughter included right. in it. it's right. never just like scholars sitting at a right. table in a meeting going what should we do about right. this we're no not matter trying, how much we want to yeah we're not we're not trying to save the world we're just you know we're observing 
the world around us. Right. And then, you know, it'd be funny. <laughs> and then yeah. you know, usually Trevor throws in something completely yeah. irrelevant, right. but it just makes sense. And you're just like, that's why Trevor's Trevor. Right. I was, I was talking to my dad about his sense of humor and his type of like, dude, he is so funny. It, it, it is a different level of funny. And it's just it was like, like whole, it's like hole in ones. Yeah, hole in one deadpans. He waits, he waits, he waits. And then he goes, just not now, not yeah. now. Oh, I see the door open no. now. And then someone pauses and, yeah. well, yeah. And then everyone's bah! falling on the ground. Were you there that night when we were just randomly Google imaging pictures of he- people, and and no. this picture came up of just a random dude, and he was like, "Hi, my name's Brian. I play fullback." <laughs> were you there for that? No, I was. That was insane. That was like a, a quick shooter where, where he everything he was saying was like boom, 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 straight fire. It was crazy, and I just one of those guys you're just like you want to just follow around mm-hmm. just to hear his social right. commentary. Right. And I mean, uh, Tucker and I listened to on on our Florida trip. We listened, or he fell asleep listening to. But we listened to the Colby's podcast. Yeah, that was a fun one during the middle of the thunderstorm. Yeah. And then I listened to... We talked about the Mariana Trench and stuff. Tucker was asleep by then. We were in the <laughs> middle of Alabama at about 3 a.m. Right. We went through there. But right. I'm sitting here just going, no shit. That, yeah. It's wonderful. That was a fun one. I I, uh, I don't remember who I had scheduled, but they backed out. And I'm like, I don't even... Colby, I'll just text him. And he was like, yeah, I'll be over. And then we had a grand old time. We, we sipped some whiskey, and he had a lot of cool t- stuff to talk about. So Yes, he did. And that's yeah. what I like about him wit trevor mm-hmm. your brother even mm-hmm. though they're like a couple years younger than us mm-hmm. by hanging around you and listening to the cat or uh, joe and listening to all the other influences that you have graced us with with <laughs> knowing about like you said they're much better conversationalists they have a point of view they right, have right. an opinion that they can support with well i saw this study or did you see this right. and it's it's so humbling to be around those kind of guys mm-hmm. especially in a group mm-hmm. and listen to them because again they can be extremely funny oh yeah absolutely and extremely intellectual i think it's just because they're so comfortable with each other right it's just they we've grown up with each other there's always been a sense uh, of yeah. i know that guy he knows me and then you add a few experiences in along the way of like bonding whether it's you know, football, tackling each other in football or, you Going know, a some, camping trip, a camping a trip or a party where, you know, the, so, I mean, <laughs> drinking uh, is a very good bonding it's a social substance. Lubricant. Yeah. Social lubricant. But yeah. Yeah. Those guys are cool. Most, all of our, all of our crew is good. And then we have some of the other guys like Alex, who was just here, Alex Hill. And then I work with a guy named Alex and the Russian and the uh, Russian. a couple other guys, but they're kind of the, they're, they're the same way, but they are like more motivated like dylan is motivated but <clears throat> he uh is comfortable at the altitude that he's cruising at exactly which is g- cool and everything but like both those alex's and you and a couple other people like th- you guys are trying to gain altitude yeah and so i like to hang out with those people a little bit because it inspires me it, it like shoots over to me like i look over and go whoa dude caleb just quit his job well quit most of his job and now he's doing what he wants like i want to do that you know yeah if he can do it i can do it that kind of thing exactly yeah and it's again like his his altitude like dylan and colby and like like they're happy mm-hmm. and that's what we're trying to attain just by gaining our own altitude not right. not in saying it's even higher or it, it's just what we see like our mountain is not the same size as their mountain right right and speaking of mountains oh god we have a story to talk about later with the mountain oh you went to Colorado. i almost died oh for 14 miles oh you hiked death no i drove oh (laughs) death was never more than a couple feet away and my friend Okay, let's just get into that. I'm Colby, sorry. Dylan, Tra- all you guys, we love you. And and I just love like all, the whole crew we have. But. I hiked for 14 miles. I'm like, yeah, that would suck. I drove for 14 miles. <laughs> so my, my first ever trip to Colorado. Well, you've never been there? No. Wow. Okay. I'm, I'm getting out a lot more in my, in my uh, elder after, years. After you got married. Exactly, which is hilarious. Uh, she, she's the catalyst for it. Bless her heart. But it was a softball tournament, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. 
like so something good did like come of it. Two hundred and some teams, like, oh like high level competition. Wow. And I got a got a great tan from sitting around and cheering and nice. getting really too hyped up about a softball game and nice. going just just stupid umpires. Right. And I'm just like, good lord, let it go. But so we drove there. Like when I got back from Florida after driving another like twenty two hours straight with Tucker. Right. We got back Sunday. That Monday, I woke up at 5.30 a.m., slept till about Fort Hayes, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then drove the rest of the way. And, like, we hit the Colorado State line, and there's a city called Canarado. How clever. Original? I think so. We cross it, and Courtney's just like, what's... Well, we're, getting, we're getting ready to go through uh, Canarado. Oh, my God. I'm just like, honey, it's Canarado. She goes, oh, that's cool. I was like... <laughs> Baiting her, I was like, Canarado. You get it? Yeah, we're going through it. Kansas, Colorado, Colorado like Canarado. Right. <gasps> Texarkana? I never would have got Texacoma. that. Texacoma? Oh my God, woman. Uh, it's like every uh, every boyfriend, girlfriend's dog's name. You put the two names together, right? <laughs> Are you trying to do yours? You're trying to do you and Courtney? <laughs> Clarish? Clarish. <laughs> Be like, hello, Clary. Court, courtlub. <laughs> courtlub. I would hate. I would hate a pet if it was called courtlub. You would. You'd love oh, courtlub. Come here, little courtlub. Just, just smack this. Shit okay, in. you have. You have to entertain the guests for one moment. My mom is here. Hang on. Welcome back to uh, Good Luck ninety seven point eight KTV. Uh, smooth jazz is on the. I'm just kidding. Uh, the uh, the one, the only, the most precious human being known to mankind, Leslie Seifert, is, is, is here. Um, if you do not know Leslie Seifert, take, like, your ideal image of, like, the perfect grandmother. Just, like, I want to go to grandma's house and just, like, make that person even sweeter and better and ultimately just like i don't even know how she like maintains so much patience and love and forgiveness for colton <laughs> and casey for so many years i've only seen her get angry a couple times and still when she gets angry you can just tell every fiber of her being is going no don't get angry you can't get angry love love forgiveness but no, for real, she is the uh, probably the sweetest woman I know, except for my own grandmother, who, you know, set the bar extremely high. But uh, if I could count how many times that woman has cooked a meal for me or welcomed me with open arms to sleep over at Colton's house when, uh, when he was grounded or in trouble or something and still didn't say anything about it, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd have a lot of... Uh, of I guess dimes or money if I had a dime. Yeah, if I had a dime. Yeah, that's that's the phrase. If I had a dime, I'd have a lot of dimes. Probably like two dollars and eighty cents, maybe three, if I round up. But they're just outside talking and um so yeah, we're getting ready to go into more of the Colorado trip after I got back from the Florida trip. Which both have very funny instances of uh meeting unique people or having unique experiences and um you're gonna laugh you're you're gonna laugh because it's just outrageous honestly what some of these people do oh oh he was coming back in but now he's not so i'm gonna look at the camera right now i think he's back ladies and gentlemen hope you've enjoyed this one-on-one time with you and me maybe my mom says hi i just i just talked about about how sweet she was for a she bought me some fruit plants of course she did you know why because that woman's an angel raspberries and kiwi plant a kiwi plant no literally i talked for a good five minutes about how lovely your mother is i heard just (laughs) (laughs) it's like man he's still going Oh, I can I can BS with the best of them. So anyway, we were we were we were passing through uh, Canarado, 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 yes. I guess Kansas uh-huh. slash Colorado, right? Half and half. Um, and 
I had this I had this premonition like I had this like predisposed thought of like okay when you hit the state line mm-hmm. that's where the fault line is and then it's just mountains <laughs> <laughs> right right do you see how uncultured yes, I am here it comes and I hit the state line I'm looking I'm just like still looks like Kansas what's so special about this place <laughs> and we drove for like good two hours I'm looking at Courtney I'm like I'm pretty sure like they're fucking with us right we're like, going the wrong direction like, like, like there's there's no mountains yeah here. And I'm, she's just like, if you look in the distance and like, you know, you'll see like. Do you see him at this point? Uh, no. Oh. It was about probably like 40 miles out. You could, okay. It was like clouds. Right. Just like low hanging clouds. And I'm just like, but I mean, for a good two and a half, three hours through Colorado, I'm just like. Yep. Flat. This, mm-hmm. this is one of the biggest conspiracies mm-hmm. known to mankind. Like there's Colorado. There's no mountains here. Even Denver, you know. Parts of Denver. Yeah, te- te- I mean, technically, it's just mm-hmm. it's like we have a view of the mountains. It's like they're not Denver's built. background. Exactly. is mountains. Yeah, but they, not Denver itself. They're not built in the mountains. No, they're yes. like on the very edge of it, which makes sense. Yes, because like I was looking at those trees, just like growing at a forty-five degree angle out of mm-hmm. a sheer rock face, and I'm just like, oh, he makes me want to go. <laughs> would want to live there. He made Couldn't want to go, dude. I would have. If property value there wasn't like five hundred grand yeah. for a studio apartment, right? Like, I'm in. <sighs> That's where we used to take like family trips, like growing up. Like we didn't go to Disney World. We didn't do that kind of stuff. We went to <laughs> Dad's medical retreats, like wilderness medical. Like the the hospital would pay for him to go on these retreats, and then he would get like certified or something. You know, they or they could like maybe do some sort of write off. <clears throat> and I'll so we would doctor. we would couple up. The, ret- the retreat with a family vacation. So we were always going to like Wyoming, Colorado, see that crisp mountain air and those pine trees and stuff. Like Nothing like it. I can just feel it right now when you start talking about it. Like, oh my God. It I need to go. It's like, go. it truly is. It's, it's just like this humble feeling mm-hmm. like, oh, like these people, like if you hike here and you mess up. Yeah. That's it. Could be, yeah. You're dead. Right. Like if you're, if you come upon a trail and like, you spook a bear sure or a cougar and like they're desperate and hungry and if they're injured and they're looking you're dead or a rattlesnake they got them big old diamondbacks right and and you don't have you don't have any service no you're dead Mm -hmm. in kansas like you can and and you also you have the possibility of getting lost like in kansas i don't feel like i could get lost no i feel like if i just keep walking in one direction i'm gonna hit you're gonna hit a square mile section in a road i'm gonna hit a highway i'm gonna hit something out there you really could get lost and in, in places die yeah yeah like it's for real like yeah. it's it's <clears throat> truly it's just this vast wilderness and yet it's beautiful and but the mountain yeah we decide to go to mount evans okay mostly okay. because uh before her dad or my wife and her her family had taken us a bourbon up pike's peak and her <laughs> Yeah, and, I can't say I did the same. And my my uh, my father in law was talking about how trippy it was, and like it just he didn't like driving up those roads. Mm. So I'm sitting here just like oh, we're not going to Pine's Peak, right? Okay. Fourteen thousand feet. No, which well, that's about what Mount Evans was actually. Really, but so we get there, and the lady like the park service waiting there to pay, and she's like just so happy. <laughs> At her yeah, job, it's <laughs> exactly. It's a cannabis. It's a cannabis free zone. Recreation. Uh, exactly. It's it's cannabis is free right. for this zone. You, you want you want Walmart <laughs> greeters to be the most friendly and happiest people in the world? Legalize weed. I mean, and I think it's just a vibe with that kind of natural beauty. But True. like, I didn't like I like you don't experience as many assholes. Like hmm. like even driving mm-hmm. on like stop and go interstate traffic at mm-hmm. rush hour. Like people are letting people in. It's just like there's no like, yeah, hmm. I'm in a hurry, but right. I'm here right now. Right. So that's what it is. You think that's the weed, or do you think it's like the money? Or I think just the vibe of the area. I think it's the vibe. Yeah, I think just everything. I think when you're surrounded by that much beauty and right. you have something to look at in traffic, and you're just like, yeah, and there's not cool. too many people, right? It's not like L.A. No, they're they're not even the metro is not even the three million. Right. So there's there is a lot of people, but there's not like an overwhelming amount of people. And they're pretty spread out because you have Aurora, yeah. you have Arvada, you have like Fort all Collins. these yeah all these great little suburbs right. around Denver. And like I don't even think we went 
through Denver, actually. Oh, really? I mean, it was where the complex was and everything was was a little bit of ways, but they had stayed in Denver a couple of years prior, and everywhere they went to like get out of Denver took them over an hour to drive. Huh? Just because Denver was so much traffic. Wow. Like the downtown. So area. they stayed. They stayed downtown. Yeah, and they said, well, "Let's stay in the suburb." Yeah, and I was like, "Oh, okay, that's fine," but. I mean, There's plenty of hotels out there too. Oh yeah, you know, like suburb hotels. Yeah, and Big. we stayed. It, it, it resembles Wichita in a way. You know, Wichita is flat and spread out. Plenty of parking, which is like so nice. Living in <laughs> LA on, and have to pay. On where you are. Well, you know, but like compared to LA. For oh sure. my god! Yeah, I don't know how many parking tickets I still have that I will never pay. But <laughs> <laughs> and and then partly my car blowing up. Like we can talk about that later, but. I'm hoping those tickets just went up in flames with her along, along with my car, you know? I have an excuse. Uh, well, my, I was going to pay. Maybe them. if I would have paid my tickets, the car wouldn't have blown up. I don't know. <laughs> we control it. <laughs> Meltdown. Anyway, Denver, softball, mountains. I'm Okay. We're going up Mount Evans, right? Mm-hmm. I, I'm terrified of heights. Oh, yeah. Not like, not like looking behind the closet door middle of the night scared. Just like when I get to a certain point my body shuts down huh it's it's, it's like standing on the stop like like second from the top step uh-huh. on a ladder uh-huh. and your stomach just goes no 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 flying's okay flying's fine yeah mountains driving up mountains not okay <laughs> i was driving and like we get there and like we're driving up and like we pay and she's like yeah there's like big horn sheep and there's babies and i'm everyone you see those and every, yeah that's cool i had a video of uh that's cool I guess not like bighorn sheep, but like horned right, sheep that right. like were apparently pretty domesticated or been fed a lot by pe- like people right. just kind of loitering about up there. That's cool. Uh, one had a baby, and like Courtney was just like, "I want to pet it." I'm like, "Don't get between them. <laughs> Those horns are very sharp." Wait a minute, what's that life insurance policy? Go pet it. <laughs> Go get it. Come on, come on. Ooh, you want to hike? Here, Sweet. stand next to it. I'll take a picture. And somebody make a loud sound. <laughs> Spook it. <laughs> Throw a rock. <laughs> but we're driving and for for a good two mile stretch because like it's just back and forth mm-hmm. and up and down like it's fine like like it's a minimalist two-lane road no guardrails mm-hmm. but like but like you have trees on each side of you okay and then you get to this point where you're high enough and it's and you and you can't see to the left because of the trees and then the trees clear and it's sheer rock face God knows how far, but to your death. Ugh. And it's like 15 miles an hour and I'm in my car and like, I'm passing like large suburbans on the outside and I panicked. Really? I couldn't feel my face. I couldn't feel my legs oh, and shit. my hands were shaking and I, and like I, I lost, like you could just tell there was no blood in my hands. It all went to my heart just to keep it beating. Holy crap. So, that was intense for me because I'm so terrified of heights. Uh-huh. Once I got to the top, um, I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to be fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just like self-talking. Okay. I'm trying to hype myself right. into driving back down the mountain. She's just like, you ready to go? I'm like, nope, 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 nope. I need to uh, do a little bit more self-talk. Hmm. But it, it was cool, but it was just like, it was, a, it was good for me. Because like, I don't know about anybody else, but like, I follow like the Red Bull social media accounts. I see these people jumping out of planes and backflips and base jumping. I'm just like, I could totally do that. (laughs) And then I even screamed out at one point. I was like, those people in the Red Bull videos are (laughs) insane. (laughs) They don't feel anything. They are, they are self-preservation sociopaths. Right. right. What? My, my own mortality. (laughs) Who needs it? I'm sitting here just going, I have so much to live for. Right. And I was just like, do I really though? Yeah. Do I really? You do. And then, and then my worst fear was getting up there, getting back down and then going, nothing else satisfies me now. (laughs) I I need more. (laughs) Let's go to Pikes. No, let's let's go to Mount Vesuvius or Mount St. Helens. I'm just going to Everest. And then like going from like shark fishing Mm -hmm. and then to like, I'm just like, that's kind of cool. There's a different kind of white person out there, mm-hmm. and there's a different kind of person biologically out right. there. Right. I learned that. 
That that's cool that you went from both ecosystems within like a day or two. It was very cool. Like down to the swamps and the uh, the bay, or what do they call it the bay? The Gulf. Gulf. The they Gulf. call it the Gulf with the shark fishing and the tropical weather, and suddenly you're in fourteen thousand feet up in the air, sheer rock faces, forty five degrees, forty five degrees, deg- right, right, pine trees and bighorn sheep, exactly. Like two of the best ecosystems in the world. Two two of the most probably glorified ecosystems. Yeah, right. It's and like. That's why I was thinking. I was like, I can get a lot of like just great content, great mm-hmm. footage of mm-hmm. each, and I did. And but those experiences, I just look back on and go, well, I'm not as afraid of heights now. Yeah, right. I'm not as afraid of sharks now. But they're still but, a completely different yeah. kind of person, right? Out there. Right. And like, I can only assume like those are the people at the bar. That that they just they they sit and they drink and they're very cerebral and that's that's why I noticed especially with the guys in Florida hmm. because to shark fish they sh- they they fish off like this twenty foot pier mm-hmm. that's probably about two hundred yards past the end of the sand into the ocean and down there like it's just like the weather brings in a rainstorm and then blue skies hmm. rainstorm blue skies because I mean they're they're around water it's it's like Portland but then just humid ninety degrees. Hmm. And I mean, like, and you can see the rain walls coming to the ocean, like everything's open. It's just like really intense all the time. But like, I talked to a gentleman named Austin and a, a gentleman named Cody. And, and these, these guys at Tucker had met up with last time he went down and told me that Austin and Cody had separately, when they caught this 13 foot hammerhead shark. I got that Snapchat. They jumped off the pier into the ocean in the a.m. Oh, jeez. In the dark to go lasso a fish. With teeth. With. Of razors. That that when they got it, eight grown men standing behind it were dwarfed by this thing. Enough to make me think people survive shark attacks? Yeah, right. That's a right. thing? Yeah. Like, how awesome. Isn't it you just one and be? done? Yeah. Like, you're, you, you're dead. Yeah. You're dead. Okay? It shows up. It's, it's over. Like, oh, I feel a bump. Oh, yeah. half my leg's gone. Yeah. I'm bleeding out. Yeah. Done. Gone. Yeah. Fish food. I will remember. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like a ukulele or something dun, down there. Dun, 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 and dun, 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 dun. It, it was so intense. And, like, I asked them about it. And it's it, it's kind of like how I hear, like, jiu-jitsu practitioners mm-hmm. or martial art guys being descri- or guys and girls being described as, like, very cerebral. Mm-hmm. Very calm. They talked about it like it was just what they do. Hmm. Yeah, we just kind of volunteer. Mm -hmm. They take a lasso, jump off the pier into the ocean at night to lasso a shark. Hmm. Let that sink in. It's interesting. It's kind of, you know, when you operate at that level, I don't, I don't know if like that's just, they just, it brings their baseline up to a certain point where Mm -hmm. that's not a stretch anymore. Yeah, probably so. But it's probably also like where you grow up. You just kind of around it so we're not around sharks but as far as like maybe they're freaked out by like a huge pack of coyotes would you be freaked yeah. out I, I, no. I would be nervous i mean i would be aware yeah. but i wouldn't be really that scared and like i asked those guys I'm like, well, have you been noodling or anything right or and, noodling and, yeah. and they'd never like they never even stick heard my of hand it. in a catfish mouth no the, way yeah they'd never heard of it hmm, right and and i feel like their first time noodling mm-hmm. in water they can't see in mm-hmm. I mean, literally sticking their hand into the mouth of a catfish or a mm-hmm. flathead or a Turtle. beaver yeah, or a beaver. Or that does not happen. A beaver? Son, it happens. That would be the best, right? My my dad tells I would the want a story. Beaver. My dad tells the story of him and the man boys and Evans, uh, who used to work up at the lumber yard, sticking a hook into one of those holes, trying to just snag a catfish. Well, a it was it was a shallow hole oh, that shit. had. Hooked a beaver oh. in the uh, in the hindquarters. Oh, and apparently, beavers don't take are kindly. extremely aggressive when you do that. <laughs> and oh god, he'd have to tell it. But it just—I mean—it came out and like whoever stuck the pole in, like hit, like just like swam into their chest, and then like you could just hear it's like just screaming in the water because it was so upset. Oh my god! Obviously enough, right? Um, 
But I feel like if those guys were to, you, you put them in, put them in that environment mm -hmm. away from their home with a bunch of guys right. they don't know, right. like to them that seems probably crazy too. Right? They'd be probably more apt sure. to do it. They have yeah. Than me jumping into the water and trying to lasso a shark. Right. I'd probably do the same thing that happened when I was driving up the mountain and just freeze up and drown. Ooh, not good. Not good for passing well, on your genes. <laughs> I, I am not inoculated to that kind of stress. Right. Maybe jump in on like a bass fish at first, then wrap him up and we'll start there. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you mean, oh, you mean an animal that can't kill me? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. This one can kill you. So good luck. Huh? <laughs> and poof. And I, uh, Tucker has a lot of that in him, I think, mm -hmm. because he grew up you know, messing around with right. snakes and lizards and you know, that kind of environment. Right, right. Because he would kayak out the baits. Like they dropped the baits down uh -huh. off the pier. Big, and he nasty would, cuts of meat. Or literally live bait fish oh, wow. that were on a hook and just yeah. swimming. Oh, wow. Yeah, gnarly. I'm just like, oh, those are the fish we catch at yeah. home. I, you know, like, like, no, <laughs> what are you a, letting it go for? That's that's bait. <laughs> <laughs> for what? Yeah, right. <laughs> you try I, you catch me on the hook. I don't know. Yeah. The bar is set hot, different for everybody, just depending on, you know, like set and setting where you, where you grew up, who you were around. Like if you had like a crazy uncle or something that might set your bar a little higher than the, the man next to you, just because of the experiences that he like, well, uncle Danny always used to shoot ball rockets out his ass, you know, like, that's what I'll do. <laughs> you know, like, and then you come along like, oh, I'm going to hold it in my hand. I'm so crazy or something, you know, well, it, it to me, it kind of parallels not to the extent of, but like kind of post-traumatic stress. Like mm -hmm. when you operate at that level, mm -hmm. just like fishing for bass, you're just like, what did we do? Like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. Or like athletes mm -hmm. that were like in the limelight and in such extreme competition all the time, the second they retire, right? they don't know what to do with they themselves. They can't match that feeling anymore. So I'm just like, Tucker, do you have like an end game with this? Like, sure. like going back to cutting hair, might not do it for you. Yeah, right. Because, I mean, just filming all this stuff and seeing this stuff, I'm just like, oh, like, like, it, like it affected me. I was just right. like, this is sweet. Like, you're seeing all this stuff. I know I never want to do any of that stuff. Right. right. It's, to me, it's psychotic. <laughs> but I can see where those guys, because, I mean, like, I think, I think I heard a story or read something about Travis Pastrana. Oh God! Speaking they, of setting the bar high, they they had done like a, a, a neurological scan. Like is it, is pet scan? A, is that a cat scan where like you see the a, different parts of the brain light up when they're shown images? Oh, or it's video? A F fMRI, functional magnetic resonance machine. That image. They they did some yeah they did something to that effect where they they showed him video mm -hmm. of him jumping out of planes and his prefrontal cortex just shut off and. Like crashing in his rally car, double backflip, just showing him all this stuff. Huh. Nothing. No, what do you mean nothing? Like, like there was no increase in heart rate. There was no increase in ep uh, norepinephrine. Hmm. He was just like the fear gene or feeling is muted. Wow. So self-preservation really never plays a role in it. Well, they're, 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 usually that's not a good thing no and they're not taking their own mortality into right. into into account like the consequence to them is is right separate from the act right yet our fathers influenced <laughs> us you had a, a police officer as a father I had a doctor yeah. which are see very similar things just at, on different time scales yeah. you, your dad sees it when it happens my dad sees it 30 minutes after it happens, yeah. you know, and tries to either deceased or whatever right, happens. Right. Yeah. So and when they, when you, when people go, Oh, you shouldn't text and drive, don't text and drive. And you're like, eh, whatever. Yeah. Our dads saw the very end game of the dude's head in the back seat while his hand is still holding the phone, you know, like that kind of shit kind of makes me sick to think about it. But that's, that's the truth. Right. And yeah. okay. Yeah. Cody and Austin, they jump off the pier and they wrestle a shark, but there is the chance that they're freaking throat gets ripped out and you look down and your best friend is getting ripped apart, you know, like, well, it, oh, exactly. Right. Right. And, and, and Cody had brought that up. And, and again, both those guys just talk about it. Mm -hmm. Like we talk about going to Starbucks. It's like, it's like what are you going to get? I uh, probably, you know, right. Uh, iced white mocha with you know, probably espresso. like a black tip or maybe like a, a hammerhead would be cool. Yeah. And he was talking so to Austin. Open. He goes, he goes, yeah, man, I was, I was like really happy that shark because the shark did wind up dying. Uh huh. The big one. Yeah. Oh shit. 
and because when they were last like they it had stopped swimming oh suffocated and and that's why like before you la- bring it up you have to keep them moving in the water huh. which makes sense because right. that's how the oxygen gets through the water and gets right. through their gills right. and, but at, at some point but between lassoing it and then bringing it to shore it, it had passed hmm. and Cody said that I noticed it because whenever they were pulling it in he was trying to like maneuver it to where it was like coming in head first instead right. of sideways right. getting more water and it like the some wave or something had shifted and his hand went in the shark's mouth <laughs> and he goes he goes I felt like one tooth like on the back of my hand and I pulled it out and I was like oh my god that shark was dead oh my god because like they had pulled up a couple like like baby I think they were black tip sharks uh-huh. and then we got video of a hammer like a like a six seven foot hammerhead yeah and they were trying to get the hook out and to get the hook out it's kind of a graphic thing but they wrap the lasso between the hook and the outside of the mouth and they just yank it out hmm. well part of that rope kind of like slipped and went right on like the, I guess the shark's tongue mm-hmm. area immediately just clamped down on it mm. and Austin had kind of had to pull his hand back because he was going to get the last so I'm just I have this no gloves or anything just bare hands no that's a finger that's a hand They're coming off psychotic. that's a hand coming off right people. if that thing clamps down that is a just bear trap Go baby on. sharks sharp teeth just rows of them. right right I have a video I need to show you but yeah no bye bye yeah like you if, if you can get them out of its mouth maybe sew it back ah. on but that's that's shearing them off yeah it's gone and i'm sitting here videoing all this going please bite that hand. <laughs> i want to go viral a true tv producer we're gonna we're gonna have some passive i want you to stick your hand in the mouth one more time i didn't get that shot now perfect blood, yeah. blood. oh my god Dustin what and then we're passive income off the youtube advertisements yeah boom son forever I just man have, gets his hand bit off by shark. Done. <laughs> Retweet. I'm moving to Malibu and I'm retiring <laughs> after that video. That's where that guy that filmed the shark attack lives. Yeah. And Miley Cyrus is right there. Miley, what's up? That's crazy. So you, so just to put it in perspective for our listeners, you and Tucker went down to uh, Florida, and Venice, Florida. Tucker really, he's been doing this for at least several years now at least five maybe he goes down there and shark fishes in fact he's getting into it so much he has like a four thousand dollar rod and reel and stuff and anyway the point was you were going to go down there maybe film some spec uh footage yeah and then at the end of it all we were going to maybe try to put like a tv show or like a mini youtube series together just Mm -hmm. about shark fishing and maybe just a mini doc actually like one of those uh, like a vice documentary exactly so we're shark fishing and tucker and it's funny especially i mean you know this how many projects revolve around tucker being like the main guy like we'll we'll follow you around when you do falconry and then we'll do a little mini dock around you we're gonna follow you around when you cut hair and we're gonna make like a mini dock around you like he's just no wonder he's moving to florida he's sick of being in the center of our projects well no it's it's funny you say that because i me and him in a car for 22 hours get real comfortable huh we well it tells you what kind of of a person he is that I can drive within a speck of a week, literally almost two days with him, and then come back down a couple of days later here and spend three hours talking to him and then another 30 minutes texting him. Right, right. He, He's just one of those guys, and I tell him this pretty candidly, that he is a marketer's dream. He is eclectic. He's extremely mm-hmm. eccentric mm-hmm. in all the positive ways. He owns who he is. He, is he doesn't. He doesn't try to hide his style no. or what he wants, despite him driving in the left lane almost exclusively. Which to him, when I say, "Tucker, what about the fuel behind you?" It's whatever. <laughs> but that, I mean, that kind Typical. of that right. kind of embodies exactly. how he feels about right. people's right. Perspe- or perspectives or, or opinions of right. him, and all the little idiosyncrasies, all the things that make him Tucker, I extremely respect. And his insight, I I enjoy because he's so passionate about mm-hmm. the things that he that he wants mm-hmm. to do, and they just happen to be kind of extreme, off the wall things that mm-hmm. some people don't even know exist. Most people don't know. No, and the whole basis of the Florida trip was to go down to get an idea of the surroundings, the pier, the people, mm-hmm. which 
it's a gold mine actually right, with right. The, with those people. And Tucker's actually moving down there, I think, in less than a week. He, oh wow! He worked out a, a living arrangement with some of the guys. I mean, they accept him fully. Right. And That's I, cool. And I see that dynamic, and I'm like, he belongs here. Because hmm. I mean, he had been down there once three weeks earlier, and when I got there, uh, Cody, before I even knew he was Cody, was unpacking his stuff, and I was in Tucker's truck getting something out. And he goes, is he out there? Like he, he recognized his truck because Tucker slept in his truck oh, right. for an entire week when he right. went down there. I said, yeah, and we introduced each other and talked to him. And I was just like, he he. when you look at him on the pier, yeah. you're just like, he's home right, right now. Right. And I, I couldn't be more excited for him to, to jump down there and experience that kind of lifestyle where people are fully accepting of him right. as a person regardless of any kind of flair he has or style it's mm-hmm. like it's you can just tell because the way they talk to him the way they it talk about him yeah it's know. it's it's like a kid getting drafted for baseball going into a new clubhouse with a bunch of other professional guys mm-hmm. his first time there and most often it's just this welcoming environment like right. welcome to the brotherhood right it's like this fraternity of guys we all do this whether professionally right. or recreationally, because we love it, mm-hmm. welcome. That's exactly how Jujitsu is. Yes. When we walked in that first day, it was, we're big dudes, so we look intimidating. Like, yeah, of course, we look intimidating. And we got those looks of like, oh, shit, you know, are these guys going to be douchebags? Are they going to be, one's got a ponytail, you know, like that's total stereotype, you know. But it was all welcoming, you know, any questions like, you guys need to stand down here. You're the lowest belt. You know, when we do this, make sure you bow. It was just like everyone looked out for us, especially when we were rolling and we just got our asses kicked, you know, totally mm. getting choked out and arm barred and everything. And there's nothing we can do about it, right? Nope. And as soon as we tap, they look at us and go, what you could have done is this, this, this. And it's like, oh, okay. And then they keep saying, you know, we've been doing it for about a month now. And they go, you guys are getting so good. And I just want to be like, because of you guys, we, yeah. we would just still be flailing, but you guys keep pointing out and we're at least humble enough to like accept the advice and kind of stow it away so that next time we find ourselves in this position, we go, oh yeah, Jeremiah did tell me that when I'm in this move I, or in this position, I can try to do this if I, if I can. Or Dave did show me this midway through the, through the role. So exactly. it must be something that you know speaks to, the, and I don't want to like ostracize women or anything, but it's kind of a man thing, isn't it? It's kind of like a tribe, like a hunting tribe that would go out You'd have to be accepting of everyone. Yeah, it's it's definitely like definitely deep down genetically biological. They they have whether it's they have their fishing. book clubs. Yeah, they, they, right. they have their PTO meetings. Yeah, where they get together and plan all this stuff. Right. It's normally just not as intense, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that doesn't make it worthless. It's just to eat your own, mm-hmm. and just a little better fit with the XY chromosome. Yeah, right. The, the physicality, mm-hmm. of it. physicality, and then just the I feel like maybe men were designed or evolved a little more to operate with one another because we're about to take down this giant mammoth. And if if you're not in sync with me, we're both getting our asses trunked by, by his tusk or something or, you know, yeah. whatever. If Cody jumps in the water on a giant shark and Austin's not like spotting him, the shark yeah. just tears him up. I mean, if, you know, all that sort of stuff, it's what a higher, uh, it's a higher payoff, but also like a higher pain a higher, uh, what would you call that? Like high risk, high, high risk. risk, way higher risk. Yeah. So, it, yeah. And it's, it, again, I think it's kind of a fraternal thing mm-hmm. where we all rec, I mean, like, like freaking green berets or, or, mm-hmm. or Marines, you know, mm-hmm. like, like the Jocko thing, you know, those, his men and, and him have a bond, have kind just this internal thing that no one else. Right. Not even people like like who go shark fish like like it's such an intense thing that they right. went under so much stress every second of every day for the entire time they were right. on deployment, mm-hmm. and that if they don't have their eyes dotted, their t's crossed, one of our men could die. Could die. It's life or death, and it's on you and or that, whoever did. Yeah, prep. and that that kind of intensity mm-hmm. it can't be replicated in football. It can't be replicated in any kind of competition. Mm-hmm. 
because it's not life and death. Right. But it can, it can be, uh, like minorly replicated. That's what football is, yes. you know, yeah. but it's, I mean, what like you're talking about culture of, exactly. of all these. Yeah, right. You're talking the tip, the epitome of, of that, what we're talking about. The highest point of the right. mountain. And then right. it goes down and sure. Just right. All, all the subcultures yeah. of martial arts and, and shark and, fishing and, and hunting and whatever else. The, the stakes aren't as high, but that mm-hmm. doesn't mean the rapport and the camaraderie of the individuals in right. it isn't the same. Like right. like the, the powwow that you went to the other night, mm-hmm. like I just it's such a cool thing to see because like that's that's them entertaining and going back to their warrior culture, right? And to me, that's just one of the coolest things to see is that they're all in sync, yeah, just by the beat of a drum, a chant. Which just like sends chills up your spine. Oh yeah, it was it was crazy because like they're they're replicating the same things they used to do before they went and killed Custer, yeah, or yeah, or right. they went and and fought for their own freedom or, oh, right. or whatever else. Or it's even just, previous before that, when it was just just Native American Indians is hanging out doing their thing. Of there's a clan or a tribe like right over there. They got a lot of good horses. Let's just go rob a few. And the and I thought what was cool from the books that I've read of the history of Native Americans is like everyone kind of had rules of engagement Mm -hmm. that were like, you can come rob our ponies or whatever. We can come rob yours, but we can also kill you, but you can't really get mad that we killed you because Mm -hmm. it's just part of like the rules. Like, yeah, you kill us, but you're trying to take our ponies. But the person that killed that guy is now like a higher warrior. And then, but you can also have that accolade if you kill one of us. I don't know. There's just like a understanding. At least it felt like that when I was reading those books. Yeah. And and I think that, that kind of extends from their or coming of age rituals, right. like sending them out with no food, right. no Spear water, box and whatnot. And like, none of us can can just like actually not very easily experience that. I mean, I think I think before cell phones, before mm-hmm. comfort and convenience, it was much easier to just to go from a TP out into the wild. Mm-hmm. You take ninety nine percent of 18 to 25 age males oh, yeah. who who aren't outdoorsmen mm-hmm. or a martial artist they're gonna they're gonna die yeah they're they're gonna sit there and try to get cell phone service yeah and and just walk around and they're gonna probably get jacked by some sort of predator the, the first time i ever understood that that was like a true thing was when josh and i first moved to california and as I'm talking, we were going to school too. We were going to Orange Coast College, which is a community. O- OCCC. OCC, which is a community college in Orange County. And uh, I was just talking to some of these kids. And I was a kid at the time too or whatever, but still I'm a kid. But they, I remember talking to one kid and coming across the idea of mowing, mowing the lawn. And he, he's like, no, I've never mowed the lawn before. I was like, okay. And then it turns out that he didn't even know where to start. Like, I don't even know what I'd do to start mowing the lawn. And then I kind of thought, because I th- might have been saying something about chainsaw back home. Like, oh, yeah, we cut fire with chainsaws. I didn't, never even ran a chainsaw, you know. Which is, that one's a little more understandable. Like, okay, well, that's fine. You live in the city. But then it just kept dwindling down to, what have you done? Like, what what do you know how to do? For like, real. Or what classes are you taking here? You know, like, what in the world? And then that perspective is easier to understand why people mm. don't understand where food comes from. Yeah, or or anything, or like um, the whole Cecil thing getting ex- just exploded. No one understands. They just see that they. I don't want to call the city people out because there's a lot of smart city people that did not obviously yes. that live in a metropolis that didn't fall for that sort of stuff. But you just hear so all much, the voices because yeah, everyone has a voice. So much of the population, especially in the metropolis area, just gets fed media information whether that's tv or could even be twitter it could be even facebook or whatever but that's all they can that's all they get they don't actually get the actual experience or they don't actually know a hunter or an outdoorsman like personally whether it's an uncle or a dad or or a brother or just their neighbor you know they they just don't know anyone that does that kind of stuff everyone goes to work in an office and they skateboard or they just they do things that are in a metropolis type setting which is fine but then it can get, that's how those stories can get spun out of control because people are not aware. They're not uh, up to date on the truth of what's happening. Like, yeah, Cecil loved to kill little baby lion cubs. Like, he killed more lions than the guy that shot Cecil, you know? Than the hunters that yeah. are paying right. six figures to go over there and support a tribe, yeah. support right. the conservation of that species right. by killing off a male that's beyond right. breeding maturity 
and is now killing offspring exactly. that's not his yeah. to bring the females back. And the six figure the is dumping right into the lion conservation or giraffe exactly. conservation, or whatever it is, you know. I explained that to individuals that I was uh, mm-hmm. co workers with that, that didn't know that. Had not a clue. No a clue. If you just take the surface, I, in fact, I retweeted today a photo on Twitter of a giraffe that got shot, like an archer had shot this giraffe and. He's, he's standing by, you know, typical, I'm standing by my dead animal, I have my bow, whatever. How do you stand by a dead giraffe? Like, is he that, was is that one of the buff most, as hell. Like, was that this, like one of the most awkward photos? Just like, he was like me holding stand the head by up. I don't know. Oh. He was like, oh, but, but like then there were, a barbarian. He was pretty, I mean, I took a good look at him. He was, he was swole. Uh, but there were three photos, and then one of the photos was the heart. And I'm talking the heart's like this freaking big. And at least it was the picture, like, and he's like, I heart giraffe, is, is, what the, is what the tweet said. That could be important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But um, I retweeted I it, and I, I kind of got a little shitstorm thrown at me from a couple of people that I know. And it was the typical, oh, my God, giraffes are uh, endangered, and who's going who's gonna, to – no one eats giraffe and all that stuff, which is like, okay, fine, I get it. You're totally it, – it's hard to look at. I like giraffes. Giraffes are from Lion King. They're cool, you know. There's they, When they're babies, they run around, they trip, and they're cute and everything. As Joe Rogan puts it, another day with no lions. Another day with In the no zoo. lions. It's like yeah. giraffes like, want to be – like. They let babies yeah. feed them. Right, yeah. right. So For when real. you see a dead one, and you're like, look at this motherfucker. And he's got these huge muscles, and he's kind of following this like stereotype of a bro or a meathead or whatever. So now you're pairing up these these few ideas that you have, and now you're getting this negative image. But you don't have the whole picture, you know? No. So it's like, okay, this I, – I don't know the story on it, but I was guessing that, like you said – this giraffe is probably way over age. It's not going to breed anymore. It's actually probably maybe keeping the younger males away from the females yeah. and not allowing them to breed. And then the longer that goes, a poacher nap like cracks one of the young males. And now you can't breed anymore. Now this population is in decline. Yeah. And then it all goes back to what you were saying about the six figures. That guy, I guarantee that guy paid a crap ton of money to go on that safari hunt thing. And that's all going to giraffe conservation. You take one out and they get 500 grand to that giraffe conservation yeah. area, right? And that community can can sustain itself right. and potentially thrive right. by the notoriety that it mm-hmm. receives. And it, it again, it's operating at so many levels that mm-hmm. people either don't care to know mm-hmm. or are ignorant to or say, yeah, well, but and their their right. their own personal virtue and morality kind right. of comes out and they try to let everybody know that I like giraffes and right. I want them to live and have you seen the planet Earth where those two yeah. giraffes are fighting each other? Yeah. <laughs> the neck. <laughs> gnarly yeah for sure they don't care no they don't know they're endangered they're just no they, they're playing the game right and like speaking of endangered I have to keep this kind of cagey but we uh in florida we, we were driving and came across a loggerhead sea turtle hmm. massive animal like alligator snappers no this this no. thing's head was as big as tucker's head jeez and it was stuck like it was like this beachside road again just like middle of the night we were headed back and it was like stuck the shell was stuck under a guardrail mm. and the back end of it was in the road like we had to like get out of our lane to avoid it and we were both like we were all like what, like, what, what was that and Tucker puts it in reverse and we drive back and huge sea turtle find out they're endangered mm. so despite Touching one is technically like technically harassment and a fifty thousand dollar <gasps> fine from oh. whatever agency. Yeah, like I guess tries to cons- like conserve them and make sure they're like whatever. We un unwedge it from the guardrail. We Holy we we like show it down to an opening. It goes on. It goes into the beach, and then I have video of it all the way to the water. Hmm. It, it probably had laid eggs on the upper bank on the other side of the road and then mm-hmm. just couldn't find its way because mm-hmm. it was dark, whatever. Drunk. But it was crazy. Because, like, because like I got video of all of it. Like, we got, like, pictures next to it. Like, Tucker's, like, trying to pick... Like, he can't even lift this thing off the ground. It's wow. so heavy. Big flippers. Yeah. It's, it's nuts. And then I'm showing video to, like, Cody and those guys the next day and Cody's just like, that's a loggerhead. I said, yeah. He goes, uh, that's a $50,000 fine for touching that. And then Austin comes in. He's just like, they're pretty usually pretty understanding, especially because sure. I have audio of Tucker going. We're just trying to get it to the water, and right, right. there's no harassment. You can see it's out in the road, but sure, that's the only reason I feel comfortable talking about it. Right, right. But well, allegedly, you did this, <laughs> but 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 it's crazy because like we were just driving on the road. Yeah, there's some dangerous species. Yeah, right. 
that's in, you know, like in danger yeah. of um, getting its back end crushed by a car. Sure. Because, I mean, you really couldn't tell. Like, there's weeds. You couldn't really tell what it was. And someone not paying attention, texting and driving, yeah. could have hit it. Sure. So, technically, we did a good deed. So, right. I don't think we'll get fined. No, the, I think the video right. will be fun. Right. But uh, no one's going to come find you or anything. Bring it on. I'll give you my address like uh, <laughs> like Tim Kennedy. Did you? Uh, but it's not ISIS, and I'm not Tim Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the story about the text text and driver accident that happened today in Galena? No. Someone killed a couple that was doing their morning walk, texting and driving. In Galena, today, this morning, as I'm getting my internet hooked up, my mom texts me and says, gives me the report. And then, I mean, I was Googling everything. It's like, that's how early it was. Like, it happened today, this morning. Yeah. Texting and driving. Like, is that not the dumbest fucking shit you ever thought of? And that's like, that's one of those things, like, you, you're texting, you hit something, and I can only imagine, I can only imagine the dread that you don't even want to look up and see what you hit. Right. Because you know it's over now. Yeah. My freedom, my liberty, yep. I'm going to be spending X amount on court fees. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be a defendant mm-hmm. in a vehicular manslaughter, negligent Double. driving. Devil. Murder. My mm-hmm. name is tarnished. Mm-hmm. My family mm-hmm. is going to be ridiculed. Mm-hmm. All because I was trying to let someone know Something. that I would be in Joplin right. in 15 minutes. Right. And when you think about all of that, you're just like, I'll get there when I get there. Sure. But, oh, it makes me sick thinking of that person's thought process. But it, it, it's negligence. Yeah, it really is. There's oh. no reason to be on the phone. And I, and I can't even say that I'm like, I'm, I don't do any of that. Because I do. I, I, I honestly do. I, I don't do a lot of it, but I will, you know. I don't text a lot, but I do a lot of, like, music. Where I'm like, okay, hit a track, put it away. But that's the good thing about podcasts is I can just hit a podcast and just kind of set it to exactly. the side. Um Luckily, yeah. my steering wheel has has a mechanism for changing Excellent. volume right. and going through. But I, I was listening to a Fire and the Kid podcast when mm-hmm. I got T-Bone. Oh, right. Tainted that podcast forever. I can't listen to it anymore. It scares <laughs> PTSD. me. PTSD. Yeah, exactly. But um, you know, it's – I actually I actually had a dream, and I had like a really good like just like print advertisement PSA mm-hmm. for like testing and driving. Yeah, it probably be a copyright issue. But, you know, the, the box that the iPhone comes in? Mm-hmm. Just like that on white, have have it closed, and then next to it have one like open. At the bottom it says open or closed casket. Mm. Don't text and drive. That's good. Just just a photo. Just a photo of the yeah, two boxes with like the phones it. in. Yeah. I'm just like, I had a dream about that. That's good. I don't know. Why don't we do that? I'm I've been planning on it. I've been busy. I've been traveling. Yeah, you have. You as long as you wrote it down and then shoot it to me one of these days because. I'm done with school and you're done with whatever you, your pool stuff. <laughs> I, well, no, I, I'm still well, gonna, like 90%. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm still right. going to con, uh, contract all creative work out. They need videos right. and everything. Um, it, it all worked out for the best. I have nothing poor to say about that company. The, uh, I, I learned a lot, mm-hmm. especially going from my internship on the agency side to seeing the client side of things, mm-hmm. how how your developers communicate with you, how your ad agency uh, communicates with you, how much feedback you know everyone right. needs, the invoicing process, the budgeting process, managing uh, you know content video with our social media lady. Uh, who also was our blogger and getting those consistent ideas mm-hmm. for content mapping right, and scheduling. Right. I, I'm a much better professional at what I do because of that job as well. Absolutely. And the people there were very hard to leave because they were all, you know, just stand up hardworking Kansas folks. Right. And you know, I will miss it to an extent, but they understood and I understood that this opportunity just really, it, I, I couldn't pass it up. Right. And, you know, when when I was down in Florida, good to, to I guess to go back to that. Um, like I said, there's so many characters, and I'd spoken to Tucker on the way down about how he would feel mm-hmm. you know, being a face mm-hmm. of of something that because that's what it could become. You know, and I I spoke to him dead seriously about it. And YouTube I said, YouTube 
you know, you have a movie or a video go, say we have 10 videos and they're all 500,000 views. That's what, 5 million views, right? That like that. that translates to a lot <laughs> of advertising dollars. Well, that's a lot of times that people have seen Tucker, you know, and it doesn't take too much to just type in Tucker or Taylor on Facebook, you know, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you, he has all these Facebook requests. Like it can just take off like that. And that's the beauty of what we do is that there's no formula. And I told him, no. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, you could do everything right. Everything by the book, best practices. Right. Exactly. And get nothing. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, I'm thinking of this, this company does everything right. Like, um, they're a very good established company. I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about them, but they have mm -hmm. like a formula for what they do. And, and a lot of their internet videos and whatnot are just, they're popular, but Cookie they're not cutter. like, yeah, I mean, I like them, but they just don't explode. Like I think they want, you just can't replicate something viral. It, it takes a no. lot of, I don't know. It's, it's, it's almost like a, just random, just a random, that video is going to be viral right now. Like what are this is fidget spinners? Where the hell do these fidget spinners come from? Pop culture is a strange. It just strange took landscape. off. It was just yeah. a couple of times, a couple of retweets, a few memes and <laughs> the whole world is saturated in fidget spinners. And if you look back, I can't really think of what was before fidget spinners and I doubt anyone else could either, but that's what fidget spinners will become because that's there's the something coming down the pipe. That's going to be retweeted a couple of times. Like, Right now, uh, one of the big things is the memes of CNN getting its ass kicked. Have you seen those? I saw I saw <laughs> the one that you shared. Uh, oh, my God. What was it? Well, well, the the big controversy was over the one of when Donald Trump made a right. guest appearance on WWE <laughs> and him like like suplexing yeah. or no, uh, like like RKOing right. the, the CNN or the guy with the CNN over right. his face. But he tweeted that. Can you imagine Obama tweeted that? I love it. I mean, I do too. I obviously I do not think the guy running the show should have that much time on his hands. Yeah, exactly. But I'm saying I wouldn't turn down a chance to be like his his video editor that right. does that for him. This one. Oh, it's Indiana Jones. I forgot. Oh yeah, the Indiana Jones <laughs> where he Indiana. just shoots it. <laughs> Dang it! Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Which this is uh, improv. <laughs> 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 the tweet shoots out on the screen. That's an improv scene. I don't know if you know that. That's that's so great because it, I, I actually did know that. And it, it's so great because, like, especially, like, the uh, the demographic that was quite possibly the reason for him winning the election. Uh-huh. I grew up watching that scene just in <laughs> right. passing yeah. with my dad. Right. And just, like, oh, look at that guy. He's a fancy. Oh, of Indiana Jones right. is the man. Right. And it, it's, Can you imagine the choreograph uh, choreographer of that scene where he's like taking days, weeks, months to plan this out, plenty. and then Harrison's just like, and the director, I love it, keep it, cut it, let's go. I mean, the choreographer probably got paid still, so he doesn't care, but, but still. Yeah, if you're the director and you had this whole thing planned and he pulls something like that just so original, you, I, I, my jaw would just go. Yeah. I'm yeah, sure that's that's, that's a movie star. Oh, absolutely. You that's know. that's feeling the scene, feeling what it's going to look like in the true actor. And just you know, like Indiana acting. Jones would not fight this guy. He know he has better tools. Like he's not going to think I can use my gun. I'm going to use my whip and my fist. You know, I have other things I need to be doing yeah. right now. Are you kidding me? If I don't this have is time real, for it. right? Yeah. Same with uh, the Han Solo moment of I love you. Yeah. I know. Like, dude, that guy was so good. Guy is so good. I mean, he just and like again, like you can't replicate that. No. You can't build it in a lab. And you he can't. can't. He can't replicate it. Like this past Star Wars. And he, I mean, yeah. and I know he probably his heart probably wasn't in it. You know, he's old man and doesn't have Still to drive. Baller. Still, Still baller. baller but like it's just there wasn't. And, and part of that it's dictated by the script and by the story and by the producers and the studios and everything. And, and now Mickey much, Mouse has his big dick inside Star Wars. So and how much how much freedom he feels he has exactly. Yeah. And he's just like you know I'm gonna do it one more time and then Kylo can kill me and I'm gonna get the hell out of Star Wars and just whatever you know. Exactly. But but back in the day when he was like hungry and he pulled stuff like that, like God that guy was good. After after stuff like that, you don't have to audition anymore. No, no, no. Your no, agent no. just brings you scripts and says, "This one's six. This one's eight. This yeah. one's ten million. Take your pick." Yeah, and if you're the director and someone says, "You know, uh, how about call him Han Solo?" You know, if Harrison Ford made some changes, you're like, "I'm going to look at those changes." You know, I'm going to oh, check them out. You 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 have creative <laughs> leverage, yeah, right? That that dictates. Oh, 
Harrison Ford's going to go into DJing. Yeah. Let's go see him. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he could literally sit up there and just like scratch, Michael Jordan baseball. Scratch, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I know. It. You just you have to that's, that's you have a real to, thing. You have to get it out there. People will brag. They'll be like, "Oh, I saw Michael Jordan when he was with the Bulls. Oh, big deal." Have you did you see him when he played baseball? Did you see him that's, with the Barons? That's the that's the rarest of all Michael Jordan sightings. Yeah. You, How many people saw him when he played baseball? You could have a rookie card from the Bulls. You could have him sure. like his last yeah. game with, with right. the Wizards. Right. But if you have a baseball card of Michael Jordan with you, actual stats, you. That that thing to me is worth more than any basketball like collection card he will ever be on. Here he was. He played for the Sox. Uh, I don't think Barons. he. I don't. I, I, I do, uh, the Barons were a minor league affiliate. I don't think he ever was actually in the show. Oh, okay. He never got to the MLB. Uh, when when you see the Sox, like especially with like that kind of uh, uh-huh. with that kind of stadium, probably spring training. Okay. Where they all wear the major league affiliate uh, uniforms and. Go by it name. That's hilarious, dude. Uh, yeah, but I think he was with the Baron. Have you ever seen the 30 for 30 with Michael Jordan? I don't believe I have. He talks about why he did baseball, and he did it because of his dad's encouragement. Yeah. He was just like, something I think his dad encouraged him, like anything you're interested in, just do it. Just go do it. Like, don't let fear hold you back. And he was getting kind of burnt out on the, base, or on the basketball. And then he moved to baseball, and he did it for his dad. I think his dad passed away right around that time, too. Well, you remember the scene in Space Jam? Yes. Where the beginning, he goes, baseball, that's a real sport. Oh, nice. So, like, I right never there, caught that, dude. They planted that seed. I never caught that. Because his dad was a huge baseball fan. Right, the very first one, he's outside shooting in yes. the dark. And then <sighs> and then his dad did pass away around that time. Right. And he had, he had that press conference and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to pursue a, a career in professional baseball hmm. and like all the reporters like did that just like mosh thing where they're just like michael michael right. and it's just like it just noise overtakes the scene right and slider yeah. don't swing literally <laughs> uh i that might i told been, you not to swing that might have been a 30 30 for 30 but no he literally had catchers huh. tipping him off to right. pitches trying you know trying to help him because it's michael jordan right right and it you know he's a legend and you're right. just like It'd be cool to see. We're, Absolutely, this is a minor league game that means nothing. I mean, that's why he was so good is because of his mentality. That's why, like, when people are like, "Who's better, LeBron James or Michael Jordan?" To me, it's no doubt Michael Jordan because of what he did. He might not have the the, the best stats compared to LeBron or anything. Um, the dude played with the flu. I've seen LeBron take the bench because it's too hot. The stadium's the air conditioning wasn't working. Like, yeah, what the. F- fuck dude you are the top level athlete the best in the league and you're sitting down like or you know um, what was the other thing <laughs> or just going to play baseball you know like he's he had that much courage to go you know what? i'm gonna play base- i'm gonna play baseball you're a great basketball player i know but I'd, i'm not just gonna try baseball i'm just gonna sound fun you know that takes courage just dude. like kind of try to step away from the expectations of yeah. of this spot and just go out and relax right you know baseball lends itself to some times of inner reflection and introspection sure. and meditation i'll never there. forget chaos theory at the oh, royals game dear god <laughs> get caleb drunk at, at the royals game with some good ipa and we will go through chaos theory between the you know, ball and every all the aspects of rotation and earth rotation and the sun and all that do kind you know of what's chance. crazy about that day is that i i think back to it and mm-hmm. i don't remember drinking that much mm-hmm I like we had shots. We celebrated for the uh, bachelor party, mm-hmm. and I sit down and I was talking to Andrew, I was talking to Nick, talking to you, mm-hmm. barely watching the game. Like that game to me flew by, and I remember having this feeling in my stomach, like, mm-hmm. "No, wait, S- slow, slow." It's the seventh. Slow down. Right. right. This is too much fun. Like I, I want to sit here and talk to these guys forever. Oh, it was awesome. I was sharing with Andrew. I remember the issues I had with the Joplin Outlaws and its former coach and its ownership. You and see the thing on Danny? Yeah, I saw That's I saw, cool yeah, shit. I, and, and Danny deserves that position. Yeah. Uh, he had been talking about like having a summer team like that, and I think it took Dalton uh, going to play at Cowley and being mm-hmm. in college baseball to hit for, you know, for him to kind of make sense because he was trying to have these travel teams with Riverton kids. 
to, right. to build them with up his and, sons. Yeah, and that makes sense. Right. But but now that Dalton's out and he's not having to coach in the summer, he can probably delegate somebody else or you know just rely on them to go play elsewhere. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. And and Danny played college ball, and Danny always seemed to me or Coach Weaver actually always seemed to be to be more suited mm-hmm. to be a college coach. Hmm. He just has that mentality, and, right. I, and I think he would prefer to be a college coach, and he'd, right. be, he'd be a good one. I think he embraces that grind more than a lot of coaches that you'll meet because mm-hmm. obviously he's been doing it for a long, long time. Right. And It's good at it too. Yeah, and, and I think I'm, I'm speaking completely you know, out of, out of thin air. I think he would enjoy coaching in college much more is it, than teaching. Is it teaching. college or is it like semi-pro? Like a it, quarter pro, it would technically be around like semi pro. I mean, you're, right. you're you're dealing with a bunch of college athletes. Okay, so it's but they play for the Joplin Blasters or whatever. Uh, outlaws, outlaws. It's, it's yeah, it's still the Outlaws. Um, and I think there's plenty of local kids, but they also bring in kids from Florida and all mm. corners. And there's a lot of summer leagues like that. I think that league is technically called the Mink League, and mm. it's Mink is an acronym for something. But then you get into like your high level summer collegiate baseball leagues like the Cape Cod League okay. up in Massachusetts where have you ever seen the Freddie Prince Jr. movie uh, Summer Catch? No. With Jessica Biel like everyone's young. Oh kind of. Um, yeah. Summer Catch now it sounds familiar. He's a left handed pitcher and like he's from Chatham uh, I forget what even state it's in but mm-hmm. these and then that's where a lot of like division one high profile MLB prospects go and play ball. For the, for, for the summer. Okay. But you have leagues like that all over the United States in the summer. So it's you, you get either get done with your high school and you mm-hmm. go play with one of these, or after your college season, your freshman year, sophomore year, you go find a league. You get invited, you talk to somebody, a coach, and, and you get your foot in the door. Mm. But, I mean, after playing in the college game and seeing, you know, like at Allen County, um, I played for Coach Val, and literally he, I mean, he had been there since my uh, uncle Brian Taylor had wow. been playing there and unfortunately there there were some rifts there with some down seasons and I think they wound up fire him, firing him huh I mean I mean that's like they would be like police department firing my dad oh wow like three years before he retires and like but like oh. I when, when I looked at Val I was like he's probably gonna die as a head coach hmm. like and he he just he loved it. He lived in Iola pretty much his entire life, and just that community. He Val was just oh look hey Val, and it's just he, he's a local celebrity mm-hmm. pretty much. And then playing with uh, you know Darnell at Missouri Southern, did, I never really had any riffs with any of them. I just I saw something that it uh, kind of bothers me now mm-hmm. that I, I I'm out of sports that if you're good enough to go play college ball in any sport or if you're good enough to go be in a college band or good enough to do anything in college that is technically extracurricular paying for your school but takes up most of your time right a singular focus especially sports because it's kind of, again it's kind of that fraternity when you're in it i see too many people graduate or get injured quit playing and then they have no idea mm. what to do their entire identity is wrapped up in who i am when i'm performing on the field the court the field of play right and i know that because I went through that. Mm-hmm. I had a career that I thought was set in stone. One ill-fated pitch turned it on its head, and I was left looking around going, who am I? Mm-hmm. Who am I now? Right. Where am I going? Mm-hmm. And I think that there should be a bigger emphasis on preparing kids and teaching kids to be okay with themselves outside the sport, know who they are, outside of being a competitor and be able to express themselves in creative ways or, or go take, you know, this endeavor and go, Oh, this actually, you know, kind of correlates and benefits my athletic career. Right, right. 
that's where you see coaches that play ball until they couldn't play ball anymore, Mm -hmm. couldn't find any other avenue to express themselves or feel like they're actually, like, I guess, helping society or or, or being a part of a team, which I can understand that. It's 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 a lonely feeling. But then they become coaches who don't know who they are Mm. outside of this game. So the game, in turn, becomes extremely important and to them, at times, life or death. Right. Like It is their sole identity. There was games where we got embarrassed by teams that we shouldn't have lost to in the first place. And it was a personal thing Mm. to the coach. Things have like like that's why now like around my my siblings in laws or like if they're participate I won't stick around for any kind of like post game like mm. huddle where they're talking uh-huh. even where parents are kind of sitting on the outskirts because I've been in too many huddles where expletives are thrown freely mm-hmm. where not only my character but things that nobody can control or being thrown in my face or in my teammates face where a grown man is screaming and you can see the spit flying from his face into a kid that made one mistake in a game that wasn't even a conference right right comp- and i just in the moment i had no idea what was going on but when you look back and go, oh, that's all he has. Mm-hmm. Or that's all they that's, have. And that's not isolated to just sports either. No. You see that <clears throat> in the corporate academia. world. And, or academia. Or I'm thinking of like corporate. I'm thinking of some downstream folk. You know, I'm not going to say any names or anything. No. But there are times where, you know, I look at them and I think, this is like all you got. Which is great. It's a pretty good slice of the pie. But there's not, like, I've talked about this with Alex before on the podcast when he was on, and it was my concept of multiple worlds. Like, you have all these different worlds that you kind of hop in and out of. And, like, I'd have school over here, and I'd have work over here, and I'd have my marriage over here, and I'd have my interest over here, and i just kind of hop in and out of one. So compartmentalize. It compartmentalize. But but the thing is, is that some of those worlds are fake. A lot of those worlds, more worlds are fake than they are true. So you'd hop over to school. This is kind of where I started understanding this is I'd be in school and say I would screw up a quiz or something. I, I would feel so bad. My self-esteem would just plummet, right? And then after a while, that would kind of seep into my life. And I'd kind of have like this baggage of just, you know, depression or may, not not full on depression, but just kind of a little bit blue because of that. Yep. It's like, wait a minute. Just because I got a D on that quiz doesn't mean I'm like a pathetic human being like who gives a fuck about that quiz? In fact, that whole thing is, is false over there. The teachers can't tell me to do anything. I don't have to sit in that class. I don't have to take any of the tests if I don't want to. I'm actually choosing to do this. This world is fake. And it happens over here with work. And it happens over... There's a bunch of these different things. And then until you can get that down to, okay, friends and family, that's pretty real. Mm-hmm. That's If you know if you lose someone there, it's going to hurt. Very and tangible. Very tangible. Your likes and dislike, or your your likes and interests and and hobbies and whatnot. That's that's pretty real, somewhat false, but pretty real. You know, it gives you meaning and and a purpose and whatnot. Um, besides that, there's not too many other real worlds. Most of them you're just kind of playing in and out of. Exactly. So when you say that this that this gentleman, that's all he has, it's it's speaking to like his underdeveloped, you know, underdevelopedness Sense with his self. yeah his self. He's one dimensional with this game. And then you could go deeper and, and talk about parents and uh, childhood experiences. You know, yeah. that probably all plays into all that. But yeah, I'm sure it does. Yeah. And it does with all of us, too. Absolutely. And, and I mean, it, and it wasn't just this gentleman. I mean, every coach really I've ever had, mm-hmm. with the exception of Danny mm-hmm. and with the exception of Mike Watt and Kyle Wolf at Colgan, when I played for a Pittsburgh summer team. Of course, I mean, that's still a prep level, technically. Sure. And it's summer ball and it's fun and it's right. high school. It's, it, it's, the stakes apparently aren't as high, but you get into college, and I'm, I'm sure you can ask Brad about this when he went to Arkansas, went to Fort Scott, played mm-hmm. at Pitt. You can ask Jacob and Matt when they were when they played at Pitt. It's just a different expectation, and you're dealing within a very very narrow paradigm right. of 
no, this is your job now. Yeah. We're paying for your school so you can perform for us Mm -hmm. because especially in athletics, that's how we paid for that building. Yeah. And this parking lot. All the money comes from that. Yes, it does. And that's why people who don't understand, like when they criticize competition or they Mm -hmm. give out participation trophies, they don't understand that competition and athletics, Mm -hmm. one, that's entertainment. Mm -hmm. And that's how academia and everything. Yeah. There's so many positive virtues. And, and character traits and dealing with failure and, and learning how to refine your skill down mm-hmm. to a level when you're facing people who are doing the same thing right. specifically. I think you bring up a really good point though, as far as, cause we both went through it as far as you have a goal, you have a dream, you have this vision yeah. and it just gets vaporized it's right in front of you. Right. I went through the same thing with California. I remember one time I was in California and I just kind of had this realization that I've only prepared my life till this point and now i'm just looking at a black void You're looking and like, at the grand canyon i don't know where to go from where here. Are the steps yeah. down there all this had been planned out to this point and then when i got here i thought i'll be famous or i'll be working or whatever like me getting to colorado and expecting to see mountains yeah and <laughs> wait a minute where does this go and that was the start of the of the spiral so at that point where are we going with this kids S- being able state. to find yourself outside of, of an endeavor. Oh, yeah, right, right. Keeping yourself, your identity separate from everything else that is associated with you. In fact, Adam had a really good thing. Or Adam is either Adam or Wes, can't remember. They would talk about how people will get wrapped up in their career, just like we're talking about with the coaches and stuff. And really the way that you should take, the, the perception that you should take on it is, I am a man that plays baseball. I am not a baseball player yep. like because you take that title and you put it on yourself and now you're holding this, this title and it becomes you and, and it, no, feels I'm a base, it feels great, but it's false and it's it will, fake. it will start to wreck you and your relationships and your life. It'll start to skew your, your direction. But if you can keep things separate where I am a man that plays baseball or makes movies or whatever, because if that thing gets destroyed, you don't get destroyed. You don't go, oh my God, my identity, even though you're confused and it's not really you, no, for but sure. you put yourself in there and now you feel like as your identity has exploded, but if you keep yourself distant and you know, and it doesn't mean you can't get obsessed, doesn't mean you can't be the greatest in the world, doesn't mean that you can't pass along to your kids and, and enjoy watching on the weekends or anything. It just means that you're keeping the identity separate from the hobby, action, career, whatever it is, because that is ephemeral more ephemeral than your than your true self absolutely that will get pulled from you quicker baseball is going to get pulled from you quicker because it's based on physicality it's based on talent it's based on all these things that goes quickest in life you know it is so so temporary yes and the 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 famous saying goes you know either at 18 at 30 at 38 45 Mm -hmm. at some point this this ride's going to be absolutely And then I don't know about you, but I mean, what Jeter retired a couple of years ago, I think right at around 40 mm-hmm. and now he's doing, I mean, it, it, it helps when you have that kind of notoriety to kind of build upon it. Sure. There's so many guys retiring without a tweet. Think about it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, then, seriously. Oh, what I'm I go get a part-time job back in my hometown. Right. It's, these you just hope they have some some sort of interest, whether it's like writing hope. books or re- man, shit, even reading books or going into the studio, studio and, 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 and becoming a commentator or doing something physical that you can do the rest of your life. Like I'm thinking hunting, like that's kind of like a alternative physicality move or physical thing. Like, well, I mean, I'm on the fringe of sports the, or whatnot. The baseball demographic, I think, they, is more prone to that. Definitely. Or even like jiu-jitsu or judo or anything like that where you're just kind of rolling around you're not going you're not getting jabs to the face or kickboxing which you can do that i mean if you're really healthy and angry you could pursue (laughs) that sort of thing but it's just finding something that can i don't know if replace is the right word but that's what i'm going to use like replace what you were experiencing with right now we're talking baseball or whatever uh replacing that feeling and the drive that you had it's it's almost like you're replacing the fuel that fueled your life yep so my whole point would be going back to keeping it separate keeping your identity separate so that you can have the the that fuel the, the your entire life so that you go 
at everything with the exact same uh, mentality and force. And if it is ripped from you, yeah, it might hurt a little bit, but it's not decimating, which we both experienced in our own way, you know, for spiraling out of control for both of our benefits. Yes. I mean, like I guess painful as, as Jocko says, painful. I mean, you have to detach. Mm hmm. You have mm-hmm. to detach. You have to look. You, you can just see it on, 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 on just a continuum here and go, okay, this is from here to here. Mm-hmm. Family's here to here. You compartmentalize. You prioritize. And then you understand going into my family situation where I'm going to interact with relatives and my kids and my wife. I'm not going to bring the same intensity. No. The same <laughs> that when I'm on deployment. Right. One of the, one of the most... I guess chilling things in hearing him talk about his deployment is that he never put up pictures of his family hmm. I didn't know that. because to him that would be drawing his mind away from the mission and his men and doing everything he can checking all the boxes to make sure that this next mission, this next, I guess, deployment. Wow. Everyone is safe. Wow. And he said that one of the funniest stories, which is, it's kind of like, just like, his wife, like he hadn't talked to her for like three weeks when he left for deployment. And she like sent him an email that he finally responded to. She's like, well, I hope everything's okay. Um, you know, your, this daughter's doing this, son's doing this. And then like the kids want to see your, uh, your barracks. They want to see a picture of like where you're staying. He had to go into a folder, get out their pictures and put it up take a picture while all their photos right, were up right. and send it back <laughs> oh to my him. God. As soon as he sent it, he took them Dirt, down. Yeah. You're not going to take that into the same situation where you're watching SpongeBob with your children. Right. And o- honestly, on this note, uh, Joe uh, Rogan did a interview with Dominic Cruz, mm-hmm. the former bantamweight champion of the UFC. I believe he just, he lost to uh, Cody Oh, uh, no love. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 I can't think of his name. I can't think of his last name. Right. Cody Tad Gar- Garbrandt. Gar- Garbrandt. Yeah. Garbrandt. Um, like, and he had come Funny back. Funny enough, who's uh, sponsored by on it. And, and he's actually, you know, he's a stand up guy. He had that kid, that Maddox kid that you know, had been through cancer and everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, put the belt on him in the ring. Just class act. But I mean, he clowned Dominic Cruz and Cruz has, has always been like, really glorified as being this kind of, you know, extremely hard to hit, you know, great head movement. He's like, he's very goofy in how he does things, mm-hmm. his angles of attack and how he punches and how he moves. It's very, it's just very strange. But Cody seemed to have his number. Everything was timed, mm-hmm. you know, like he'd come in, Cody would bait him in and as he was throwing shots, the counter punches, he would always just seem to catch him and, and just, Dominic Cruz has never looked so beatable than when he fought Cody Garbrandt. Mm-hmm. But this is a guy who beat TJ Dillashaw coming back from his third ACL reconstruction surgery. Jeez. Like within like a span of five years. Like right. he was a champion. After the second uh, ACL blew, they stripped the title from him. He was coming back to fight, I believe. Uh, it wasn't Dillashaw, but it was a, it was a champion. Mm-hmm. Blew out another name. Good gosh. Dillashaw winds up winning the belt, comes back, beats Dillashaw in a decision that I think was close. Because I actually watched that fight. It was a damn good fight. Big big bow hunter. But yeah. Dillashaw. Yeah, Dillashaw's awesome. You know, like they're, they're kind of all centered around like Uriah Faber and mm-hmm. like like his gym and everything. But Cruz is also a commentator on there with uh light heavyweight champion, uh DC. Um mm-hmm. but he was on Joe after he lost Cody Garbrandt. Yeah. And he talked about this very thing about I had to learn who I was not as a fighter. Mm. And he goes, and then when I go in that ring if or the octagon, if, if I win, great. If I lose, oh, well, mm. I know who I am outside and, it's, and, and how I perform right. and who I am as the athlete does not affect me any longer right. as a human because I know as a human – I bring good to people. Right. I have a space that the person that I am is good enough for. Yes. The person that I am with no agenda, no strings attached, no, can we have a picture with you? Just me, my family, and my crew mm-hmm. with no expectations. 
And he goes, that makes everything else, like you said, ephemeral. Yeah. Like if baseball's gone. Yes. It's good. I move on. I'm good. Yeah. It was fun while it lasted. And I moved on, and I I kind of had that same, I, I guess, oh, epitome that came along. That when people ask me now, it's just like, well, do you, what, would you regret it? I don't. Right. I don't, and I can I can look anyone in the eye and tell them that I am so glad that I didn't sign a contract. I didn't play professional baseball. That I'm happy that I got to grow as a person. I got mm-hmm. to learn that, that, yeah, this sucks. And what I do now. And then, you know, I, I get into a class at Pitt and, and I'm like, Oh, this fits. And then mm-hmm. I find something that gave me the same feeling as, as painting the corner for a called strike three. That's something I can do for a long time. Enjoy it. Bring in my crew with it because we all kind of share that creative vision. Mm-hmm. And then it meshes really well with the lifestyle that I want to live with my wife and where I want to live and the freedom that I want to enjoy. Right. And that if I tear my ACL doing something stupid, I'm still able to do all of this. I'm still right. able to communicate with everyone. I'm still able to to, to kind of have this sense of, I guess, purpose. Mm-hmm. And I like to think I'm not wrapped up in it. I like to think I'm just passionate, but I'm sure I tiptoe that line too often but I think you did a good job of making the, the decision you know and and at that point like what decision do you have you have one you have two decisions and one's really good and one's really bad but one's really hard to make and one's really easy to make the, for sure the, the good hard decision is what you did I'm, I'm happy I didn't I'm happy I didn't work out because I actually like my life I like where I'm do, where who I'm with I'm like where I'm going because if you were to hold on to that other decision of God, what could have been, you know, I almost had it. I could have been. And I, I find this. And then I become a baseball coach. Yeah. Or you, yeah, exactly. Or you just become, you know, bitter and hurtful towards your kids because maybe they want to, uh, swim instead of play baseball and you're pressuring <laughs> your future kids, you know, where are they yeah, <laughs> in the future? <laughs> Courtney hadn't told you yet. Has she? But no, I understand. What right. You're right. Yeah, so you just shove it down their throat. Yeah. Or completely tell them right. that, that you don't want to do that. Right. And I shut it down. You've made, exactly. You made the choice, the hard choice to bury this no matter how hard it was for you. But, but you know, you knew this is the right decision, even though it's very hard. That's the decision that you have to make. Because I was a douchebag. I was, and, and that's what I was talking to Andrew today about it. And he goes, I really didn't think. I'm like, there's a public persona, there's a facade, and then mm. there's what I think of myself. You know, your ideal self, mm-hmm. and then your actual self. Right. I didn't have a distinction between the two. It was, this is certain. So I am now entitled to this behavior mm-hmm. and this way of speaking, this way of acting. And when I look back, it makes me sick. But it's okay though; it's just all part of the journey, you know. It, it, it makes me sick, but I have no problem talking about it sure. because I, I want to be honest with one my brother-in-law, who is a prospect now himself, mm-hmm. and say again, this. This little box over here that mm-hmm. you're putting so much in, it's ephemeral. It's, it, it can be taken away mm-hmm. in an instant. Most likely will. At some, it, Statistically, most likely will. How many Michael Jordans are there? It's, it's a positive that it's going to end one day. At some point. So you're, you have to be really comfortable yeah. with yourself. Right. When you're sitting alone watching a television program, reading a book, mm-hmm. You can't you can't be sitting there dwelling on the inadequacy of of of, of what you could have done. Absolutely, because that's a black hole. Yes, that will swallow your soul. That takes all your energy and lead to uh, abusing alcohol, mm-hmm. becoming it, it. So many dark paths. On the very on the the very least, your relationships of your life will suffer. Your life will be will suffer for yeah. it. Maybe you don't totally spin off the rails. You don't murder anyone. You don't kill yourself. But you might have a long and arduous and painful life because you won't allow this thing to be let go. 
so that you can grow into the next season of your life. And you see that you see that with like older women all the time who dress as twenty one year olds. You know, it's like who well, have twenty one year olds who have twenty one year olds. Like, why don't you need to move into the next season of your life? They're just holding on to youth as much as they can. I don't want to grow old, but it's like you know, forty. That's a beautiful age. Like, there's a lot of things that you do when you're forty. You go to wine country and you go on tours because you don't have any more kids. Or I mean, there's just a lot of things per season of your life and, and you miss goes, those things yeah. and, and and that goes for every season absolutely you have to embrace what it's inevitably going to mm-hmm. bring if you hate yourself you will never be able just to be vulnerable and love mm-hmm. someone else mm-hmm. so it's it's just this this balancing act this this dichotomy of mm-hmm. what i want as a man mm-hmm. as a masculine you know adrenaline filled youth who skated by in school despite still getting good grades mm-hmm. thank you rhs teachers for for giving me the benefit of the doubt but i i look back with disdain on how i acted and how i perceived my future self and my own self and mm-hmm. i didn't even know that i had that kind of mentality i think we were at nick bonner's house in california mm-hmm. And, and and he kept bringing it up, and I and I was talking to him about it. I was just telling him how I felt because mm-hmm. I mean I think it was it was still just a couple years after at that point. So I mean it was still pretty fresh, and I right. was you know still kind of testing the water of all these different different things. And I was telling him about it, and you guys were going back and forth, burning Christmas trees and everything. <laughs> and he kind of just stopped. And this is why I love Nick because Nick just kind of looked at me and he goes. You're talking about it in a really, really healthy way. Hmm. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you're not, you're not, like you said, you're not holding on to it. He goes, you've let it go and let it, let it go rest in the pasture, mm-hmm. like where, where mm-hmm. it belongs. You look back on it with happiness and that was a good time, but you, you're not just clenching onto it, right. trying to keep it from, right. from doing what it's already done. You're not just you're not playing tug of war. He's, he's good like, about that. He is. Those he's very liars. insightful. It's he, just truth, truth saying. You know. Yep. It's not that. It's not that hard. I didn't learn it until I went to California a few times and just realized. And I'm not saying it's just California people. It's just that group, that FWC, that that group that we used to hang out with. They were just very on the point, totally truthful. Even if it was awkward, embarrassing, anything, they would just say it. And to learn that, I think, is a masterful skill. If you can get that into your repertoire, just to speak truthfully, even if it's going to offend someone, it just increases progress and growth a hundredfold. I remember talking to Wes Warner one time, and I was dating Kelsey, but I wasn't going to get married. It was very anti-marriage at the point. You never. I I remember that. (laughs) He goes, why don't you get married? And I go, well, I want to travel the world. I want to travel a little bit, do a little single type stuff. And he goes, why don't you you travel? I go, well, you know, I'm with Kelsey or whatnot, and, and I don't want to leave her. So he goes, so you're saying that you won't get married because you have a girlfriend. And I'm on the phone, and I'm speechless at this point. Like, uh. <laughs> But, well, yeah, uh, you know. It just called me, called me out, totally called me out. And there was no hesitation, no embarrassment on his end. It was, here's the information that you're giving me. Here's my feedback, just like Nick did to you. Prompt. Yeah, yeah it's a prompt. Yes. Now go now go dwell on that Absolutely. and figure out right. where you stand. The actually. little boy's like, ah. Go articulate ah, it. Ah, ah, ah. Go get where you can articulate it because right mm-hmm. now you're being irrational, yeah. illogical, yes. completely unpragmatic. Absolutely. I, I give a lot of praise to my mentors of the past. No, nope. Just putting up with me and planting those seeds yeah. and all sorts of things. Like one thing that I think about that's very difficult still is to look back on those past selves and who you despise or whatnot yeah. and love like you love that Caleb like you love 17 year old Caleb can you accept him because it's crazy because he's still in there you know it, they're just shells that have been exactly yeah. and right. it's I I understand where he was at that point yeah I don't blame him for how he acted but I don't agree now with how sure I acted but you can see where it came from. You can see where the roots, like, oh, he was doing that because of this. He was doing Ego. that because of this. Sure, but, I mean, you, you can go deeper, you know, and, like, you know, I'm not saying this is what happened, but I'm saying, it like. It very well could be. Maybe, but I'm not, I just know what I'm about throw to say. It, is, throw it out. It's like, maybe I didn't get enough attention from my dad. Like, my dad was stoic. He was out doing his job, and I just needed a little more attention. Or 
something like that. You know, there's always a route down to something crazy like that. that. We don't even know about that. We like don't that, even know. About. And then once we takes across, years and years yeah. and years, and suddenly it's kind of like, oh yeah, like somebody hits the chisel. <laughs> you're just like, oh, yep. oh I see it. I yeah. see it. There it is. Yeah. And it's it's like it's a that's those moments like of enlightenment. You're just like, oh. but you got to be quiet. You have to be. A lot of times you have to be isolated. You kind of have to be in the right state of mind to come across those things. Most of the time, sometimes you can just be out and about with your wife's family, and suddenly it just smashes it's, you it's in the, the face. A situation you, that, that that replays, that resonates, or reflects like, you as a uh, as a small child or something. You're like, oh my god, that was me. Holy shit! And I mean, that's why I enjoy reading like like any of, of, of I guess Plato slash Socrates mm-hmm. works. That's why you know the Republic. Uh, meditations, you know, Marcus Aurelius, just like that was him sitting, mm-hmm. meditating, mm-hmm. and then scribing it. Right. And you're just, and, and when I'm reading this, it, it's almost like uh, I'm reading it. I'm taking in the information. I'm not trying to memorize it for a test. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going. It's funny. That's what he thinks about that. What do I think about that? Yeah. It's just, it's, right. it's basically a book of prompts. Mm-hmm. And I think if, like, yeah, like, like back, back to that you know, crew that you had in California that just tells you what it is. Yeah. If you can surround yourself with that, imagine having no yes man and only yeah, honest man. Right. It's well, it sucks, really. It sucks. Especially if you're in the moment. Yeah. Especially if you're kind of lost like we were at that time, you know, being young men, having this idea of the world, like this is how it's gonna work out and this I'm gonna make it work out. And and somewhat kind of did teach you that you can make things work out if you try hard enough and are lucky enough. But if you're surrounded by people like that, they will pull out. In fact, they will pull out inconsistencies and illogical actions. But I remember meeting with Adam a few times and I go, listen, I just want you to listen to me and pull out my fallacies. I want you to pick them out. And he's like, you really want me to? And I go, yes, I want you to. I know it's going to hurt. Like, it's I know like it's going into suck. acupuncture the first time and just yeah. going, I want you to do my face, my hands, yeah. my... He's oh, like, I go, I need you to tell me what I'm doing wrong. And he goes, <laughs> he's like, why, why didn't you go to film school? And I was like, Cause I, I don't want to go to film school. I want to do it myself. And he goes, you are trying to feed your ego. The, you, you're trying to take the hardest path to feed your ego because you want your ego to be the biggest. Or you, your ego is very big. You want to take the Tarantino route. You know, you want to say, fuck film school. I did it myself. I made film myself, which is the hardest route you ever. You want to be the anomaly. You want to be the anomaly. And in, in that case, you're making it way harder on yourself and way harder on this girlfriend who became my wife at the time and mm-hmm. your family and everyone else. If you were really trying to do it, become this filmmaker, there are easier paths that one would have taken, but you decided to take the longest route, you know, and try to get there you, solely because you're feeding this beast of an ego. You want the most interesting Wikipedia page. Yes. And he, and you know, he was so gracious about it and it, it didn't hurt me. Cause it was like, okay, I knew that, you know, I, I you, you just put it into words. Herman Unix. Yeah. Thank you God, for, good. yeah. Yeah. But you need someone like that to just shoot you straight and say, look, look, this is what you need to hear right now. But remember, I had to, appro- did? I had to approach him. And say that to him. You know, he wasn't just going to come out and go, Colton, sit down. You know, I had to go, listen, target, shoot where it needs to be shot, you know. And are you sure you want me to do this? I mean, he was like, are you sure? I'm like, yes, just do it. I need this. Yeah. Boom. But I don't think you can fully embrace and then apply what's being told to you unless you are at the stage of broken down, Mm -hmm. fully vulnerable. Tell me. Right, because if if I'm walking and I think I'm doing the right thing, and someone tries to break me down, what am mm. I gonna do? Right, I'm gonna lash out. I'm gonna say, what what gives you, you what gives you the right? Who, yeah, like you don't know me. Right, and and haters, you, you have to leave. The, you have to check the ego at the door. Mm-hmm. You have to be extremely passive in your judgment of the way others live and others see you. You have to just completely break yourself down. Right, and I mean, I don't think you even remember what. I mean, you were you were that guy for me several times because we were going to California. Mm. I think before Kelsey was even in the picture. Mm-hmm. Still bitter about that, Kelsey. <laughs> Just kidding. But we were both working at Downstream, saving up money for this right. venture. And there right. was other facets. There was other outlets and things going on. And a couple events turned sideways. And you approached me, I think, in the dish pit at Downstream. 
and you said, listen, I don't think we need to go to California together, Mm -hmm. which hurt a lot at the time because to me that said, I'm still going to California, Mm -hmm. but you're not ready to come with me. And that, that hurt. It really did Mm -hmm. at the time. And then a year down the road, six months down the road, I look around and I'm like, oh, he was right. And when I came out to California, there was no doubt in my mind. I was like, oh, he hit the nail on the head. Mm. This would have lasted maybe all of half a year Mm -hmm. before that lifestyle would have either sent me back home or got me into more trouble than I could have got out of. Right. And I don't know how you saw that. I don't know what triggered that that response that you gave me, but you have no idea how much probably hardship you saved me and yourself. Mm-hmm. Because it, it wasn't just me. Like I would have been living with you, and just in my mind there's a lot of things that could have turned sideways if I would have been sure. let loose with the same ego that I had when mm-hmm. I got drafted and all that went on. I got right. hurt and I was angry at the world. and Right. And at the time that kind of broke down mm-hmm. the, the brotherhood that I felt towards you. And then I think honestly what it did in the long run, it made me trust you and your judgment and your honesty with me so much more mm-hmm. because I feel like I have the crew now that's going to call me on my bullshit. Right. Like you're not just going to say, yeah, Caleb, go, yeah, go, go for it. Yeah. Go to Florida and quit your job. It, if you see inconsistencies, if you see irrationality, mm-hmm. I feel completely comfortable that you guys are going to call me on it and tell me, I think we should do it this way. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the only reason I feel comfortable going into some sort of business and, and create a venture with you guys because I'm not going to alienate you. I'm not going to cause any rifts and it's vice versa and it's the whole crew. It's like, hey bro, I think we should try it right. this way. It's out of love. Yeah, you know, and then it's from a place of love. I think I think from the trust and, and and everybody being at a mature level, it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. act, yeah. Now that okay, yeah, you're right. It's, it's kind of like the Marines where like they they say uh, lead and be led. You know, like if there's six Marines, one is the leader. You know, if the firefight starts starts in the back, that guy in the back now automatically becomes a leader. You know, it's just. A flow they call it group flow or whatever and so the, every one can be simultaneously the leader and a follower all at once and that's kind of how I think you know a good business well yep. an interesting business would operate you know where wait a minute Caleb has the best idea right now let's just, just follow him he's got the best idea and until we kind of start to slow down and maybe someone else takes over do it follow him yeah. he's got he's got it under control this is the best route you know and and something like that like I would expect an idea, a broad idea that we're trying to break down mm-hmm. as, as we refine it. If if there comes a side idea or if there comes a, a fork in the road where where my idea is then compromised, I don't have any attachment to that mm-hmm. idea. Right. Because I know that you're the best at what you do. Right. Kelsey's the best at what she does. I, I feel like each part of us, especially with what we've been through and, mm-hmm. and where we are, I feel like each individual is the best at what they do. Right. And granted, we can all, we can all play these different instruments, mm-hmm. but that's all for pretty much collaborative effort going, mm-hmm. well, did you try it uh, this way or with this color or try, try, mm-hmm. leave out this part. Or what about this? You know, exactly. And that is why I wanted to do something in this industry Mm -hmm. in the first place. Right. Because from the beginning, working with you in a collaborative effort, being able to sit down with a problem or goal. Right. And go back and forth and try something out that didn't work. This this has potential. And then as as we worm our way through the stream of uh, doubt and uncertainty (laughs) towards something it never ceases to manifest itself despite the doubt, despite the, Oh, this is a piece of shit. (laughs) Right. It happens all too often. Probably every time because we're, (laughs) we're our own biggest critics. Right. But at at the very end of it, when when it, when it's done and you're just like, nice. We just, 
We just did that. No, it feels good. We started with yeah. us sitting in a room, mm-hmm. throwing shit at the wall, hoping mm-hmm. something would stick. And, right. Something did. And not not even what we create. It's the process mm-hmm. is what I'm extremely addicted to, mm-hmm. especially with people that I trust and love so much. It's, like I said, it's my dream job and it always has been mm-hmm. to be able to have the freedom to say this week... Me and Colin and Colton yes. are going to go do this. Yes. I'm going to send Kelsey and Colton right. to go get this and shoot this. I'm going to go over here and get this, send mm-hmm. it all to Colin and Colton and Alex and everybody right. else that, right. you know, that that we find that share the same intensity and passion for this as we have. And it's, it's just about controlling your time and your energy and what you want to do when you want to do it. It's it's waking up yeah. and not dreading or avoiding anything. Waking up, like flying out of bed and going, dude, today is the shoot. Today got, is the mountain shoot. I got to fly to this. Yeah. I'm meeting up with, with my homies, right. my, my crew, which we're going to share stories. And Flip on your it. YouTube. You're like, how many hits we got today? I posted, it, I posted a week ago, you know. Yeah, or podcast, yeah, who's come on the podcast? Podcast or, on a plane yeah. or a car. <laughs> and yeah. just live my life and our lives in a comfortable manner as mm-hmm. far as income, but understanding that freedom is the currency. Right. It took a long time to get here, though. And it took a lot of squirrely roads, too. You know, a lot of pain. And I'm sure there's more coming, so it's just kind of like, okay, I guess I got used to it. And we have to get used to it right. because those experiences and that pain is what makes our product, our content, mm-hmm. our own. Right. The it's, end of... It's um, going to be different than everyone else's just because sure, it's, sure. it's, it's our fingerprints. on Right. It. And that, that should be good. You know, when yes. a lot of times when we would edit films or, you know, make a track or something, I wouldn't be able to reference anything. I wouldn't be, well, it's kind of like, no, it looks like no. And I wouldn't like that because it was so different. It felt foreign. Yeah. Yes. But it's actually something you should embrace and go, well, this is just my style. This is my style and this is how I do things. And not to get that confused with poor talent or poor skill, where you're like, this is a piece of shit, you know, but this is how I do it. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. You're going to find, you know, you're going to have poor, poor skill, poor talent, but at some point you're going to come upon like, this is just, this is the way that I do it. I hold these shots longer than other people, or I have deeper bass than other people or whatever it is, but that's going to be your calling card. And I think that's difficult for people to uh, grab onto and accept because it's a kind of a defining thing. And especially millennials do not like to be defined. At least I didn't like to be defined. No. I hated when people would call me a filmmaker, only a filmmaker. Like, well, you're a filmmaker. Like, well, I'm also a football player. I'm also all these other things. I'm a multi-hyphenate. Yeah, you want to be everything, right? You don't want to be just put in a corner. But the, the longer I've gone, and especially at the end of this whole college thing where I went back to school and studied something that, I was interested in, but you know, didn't really plan on using in my life. Mm-hmm. At the end of it, it was just billboard sign, flashing neon. Find something that's worth suffering for because this is not it. You know, I suffered for two years in school, getting mm-hmm. up early, going up to school, tests, studying, blowing up your car, blowing up my car. <laughs> yes, I didn't do that. <laughs> if if shelter, yeah, you. shelters listening to this, I did not do that. That was not a conspiracy. Anyway. Um, but yeah, but it wasn't, it was, it, it was a, a forcible suffering. And I'm not saying that all schools like that, because if you're no. going to be a doctor or something and that's your goal, which I know a lot of people who that is their goal, then that suffering is worth, it's worth suffering for. I want my doctor to suffer a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause he's going to make you suffer. Exactly. Cough. But <laughs> so, but then it was just like, okay, well, what is worth suffering for? I'm getting ready to go on a camping trip next week. And it's literally taking time off, unplugging and going, processing the last five years of, the, of my life mm-hmm. and then projecting the next five to 10 and going like, last time you made a pretty rash decision, you went back to school and studied something you didn't really, you, you were interested in, but you didn't really care for, you know, don't do that again because look at all the time that got sucked away, the energy and the finances, like. Tons of it just got sucked out two years like that. So put things in perspective. Be very careful about what you choose because whatever you choose, is it's going to happen, guaranteed. The track re- record shows that you want to go to California, you made it, you did it twice, you know. You want to go back to school, you went back to school, you fucking graduated. Be careful 
what you decide on because it's going to happen, whatever it is. And so I have a good idea. Obviously, we've talked about this marketing house and doing uh, production houses and getting into that whole field, which has kind of been the goal the whole time. That's what we've always wanted to do. And we, we snaked off with baseball and we, and we went on all these paths. And, and to go back real quick to like the time that I talked to you in the dish pit and said that it was just, mm -hmm. it was, uh, as, this is like a father telling his son, uh, it hurts me more than it hurts you as he's whipping his ass, you know? No, you actually said, I, I it was, it was very, very, very difficult. And it was, it wasn't a thing that I was just wake up one day and I go, you know what, this is not going to work out. It was constantly thinking about it and projecting the, the two, the, our two paths and our two, um, goals. And it was just like, our two, I've kind of been, our two <laughs> egos. And I've kind I've been to California for a little bit. So I kind of knew the, the dynamics and the atmosphere. And it was just like, this is what's about to happen is a concoction for maybe exploding <laughs> our friendship <laughs> forever. Like this could ruin for, it. For real. Yeah. Not only ruin friendship, but also ruin like financial situations. It could ruin lives. Like, I don't know if, you know, we live on the streets for a while. Like I'm guarantee it would have been a blast. It would have been six months of fucking craziness. Good God. But at that point, that's kind of where I was like, okay, this is going to suck. This is really going to be painful for him and me. But I feel like if we just make this decision, a few things could happen. One, we could settle down and maybe we reunite. Mm -hmm. We go back, we go to California anyway. We re we go, okay, uh, I see what you're saying. Two, we kind of go our separate ways and we kind of find ourselves and we reunite later on, which is what ended up happening. Yeah. You know, you kind of went down the path um, playing baseball and then you went to a little bit of a goth rock stage which no, that that's always been inside still, of me yeah it still, it still hangs around yeah Met metal or death it, it, it went screaming high and then it just kind of mellowed out now and it hangs around you know you definitely have it about Ooh, you yeah, it does. but it was cool because you kind of went on this journey and you just picked up little trinkets on the way you know and then w we came back to a reunite like I'm back from California you're kind of back from Allen County and all that kind of stuff you've done away with baseball you discovered, and I want to say you discovered, and you had more courage in choosing a definition for yourself. I did not have the courage to do that yet, which is the reason that I chose biology. I didn't know why I did until I heard Jordan Peterson say it on a podcast, and he was saying something along the lines of, people choose to do things that they're okay to be mediocre at, but you don't choose the thing that you're passionate about because if you're mediocre at what you're passionate about, it hurts, it hurts. a hell of a lot more. So I was okay with being a mediocre biologist and I and I, I like to hide behind it and go like oh, I'm a scientist and everything but the the suffering that went that was involved with that day after day and I just saw my equipment on the shelf just get start to collect dust and I wasn't doing I do podcasts here and there but I wasn't consistent I wasn't I wasn't waking up the mornings going hell yeah it was continually telling Tucker sorry dude I can't film your shark fishing or do falconry because I got chemistry you know which long run taught me everything you can't you can't really regret you know the, the past you kind of just have to accept it integrate it move on with yourself um but it at the end of all that it was like okay i know i'm pretty damn sure i know which direction i want to go no matter hell or high water at least it feels worthy to me at least it feels like suffering for this cause is worth it it's worth it to not make as much money, but drive down to Florida with my two best friends and we're trying to get the shot. It's worth it to, you know, uh, make a, a terrible video, post it to YouTube, but then learn from that and get better. It's, it's worth it to have a bad podcast. It's worth, it's worth getting better for and suffering for these certain things that we're involved in. hundred percent, hundred percent. It's worth learning. It's worth criticism. Mm -hmm. It's worth going, please pull that video off yeah. but no forcing yourself to right. watch it and take yeah. notes and exactly go, that's where i right. screwed up i posted a damn video of jiu-jitsu last night and it was so hard to watch because i'm first off my first thought is you're gonna drop 20 pounds you're gonna immediately drop 20 pounds you're about 20 pounds over to every weight second like you need to get stronger this guy's throwing you around and you can't do anything about it but you know posting it i had some good comments i had some good anyway jeremiah the guy i was rolling with super nice told me all sorts of pointers and stuff so that's great but just the essence of even alex when alex hill was over here and he has two new tracks paul old politics and new politics which he's mm -hmm. going to release soon great tracks great tracks 
uh, I, don't both, know how, I don't know how he does that. Oh, he's super talented. He's, but he, yeah. he says, I hate listening to myself. And it's like, you're a true artist. You Welcome know, that, to the club. That's what we all say. But you're going to learn a, a thousand times more if you listen to yourself and go, okay, you know, I'm off beat there or whatever rappers think of when they or singers or whatever think of when they hear themselves on the track, you know? So he I can can't, flow though. Dude. Yeah. He, yeah. He's, he's got flow. Yeah. I, I enjoy listening. He's just to waiting things. on artwork, so it's right around Kelsey. the corner. Somebody make some artwork for us. But going back to the jiu -jitsu. egos, jiu -jitsu. Oh, or jiu jitsu, yeah. But yeah. yeah, you talk about a flame that burns away all your delusions. Jiu jitsu was it? You go in there and you think, oh yeah, I'm I'm strong. I'm a six foot two, two hundred and thirty pound grown man. <laughs> I didn't think I was gonna whip anybody, but I figured I'd hold my own, dude. The or I and I also thought I was in shape too. I thought I work out, you know, I run. Ah, no, Colton, Colton, the, Colton, the flame of truth burns away all delusion. So at the end of that session, I have never been more humble. sore in my life or humbled. Humble or get humbled. It was Be amazing. Humble or get humbled. It was good because after that session, it was like kind of a chain reaction that went through all my life. Like, oh, okay, you want to be a writer? Yeah. Big guy, you want to be a writer? How come you don't write? You don't write. You think you're a writer? Like, boom, just flames, just blasting through it. And all the way yes. through my life, you know? Oh, you think you're eating healthy? What's that right there, you know? Just exploding. It was good. Yeah. But it was so good in the sense of just a reset. And, and yeah, ever since, it's, it's been good like that. And it keeps you on track. Like a, like a well-defined psychedelic experience that mm. you carry a notebook into and go... Okay, ego. Let's take a ride. <laughs> oh god! And then you go, no. Yeah, I want out. Yeah, but it's just you, you have to face that stuff at some mm -hmm. point. You have to understand, like, why do I get angry in traffic? Why yeah. does someone else cutting someone else off mm -hmm. upset me so mm -hmm. much? I th I battle with this every day. Yeah, I'm so hypercritical. I'm hypersensitive to these yeah. things. And, I, and I, I, I still, I try to find myself in the moment. I try to detach and go, for real. Mm. Like, why, why are you acting like a bitch right now? Right. Like, are you insecure about something? Yes. Like, are, are like, and, and I think there's, there's, there's a lot of things that, that my actions towards that come from, but the fact that I'm trying to detach mm -hmm. and detect these moments and go, why are you doing this? Yeah. Like it's it's essential. Like 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 what like, like, what are you what are you gonna do about it? Right. Nothing. You have to be delicate though. You can't like, bitch. You're a little. Bitch. I you know, need I, it intensity. Happens. It happens. A guy like me, I I need myself to go. There there are a couple times. Hey, how about you just? <laughs> how about you just drive? Good yeah. Shit. Right. Quit. quit. If they if, if if they're not cutting you off, if they're not putting it you in immediate danger. Mm -hmm. Or someone else in immediate danger. They're just driving like idiots. Like Tucker says so eloquently, it's whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I I was so jealous of that of, of that yeah. frame of mind. I right. was just like, how do you do it? I literally ask him how he does it. He goes, what? I was like, never mind. I'll go to sleep. Just part of it. <laughs> I was just kidding. who he is. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I like to think I have a high situational awareness that, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, exits and perceived threats and. I learned how exhausting that can be. It can, yeah, definitely. And and it can take over all these things and, and, and make any kind of recreation within a social setting with a crowd make it unbearable. Yes. So I'm still working on that. <laughs> that's why I don't like going that's why I don't like people. I don't right. like I don't like bars. I don't right. like un, unless I got boys with me. Right, some sort of posse or crew or something. That I feel like worse especially with, with Courtney, if because she lacks a lot of situational awareness and mm -hmm. I'm just waiting for mm -hmm. one day for her to get me into a brawl with someone and get stabbed <laughs> to right. death. Right. Or me stabbed into death because I'm not scared. <laughs> and I got this pocket knife. I'm only scared of heights and I live in Kansas. Let's I do got it. A, I got a grubber. What is it, grubber? I am not cool at all. <laughs> I, I fancy myself a uh, cool guy. But Bartender, really. pour me a shot of whiskey before I kill this man. But... <laughs> And like I, I play out the situations in my head, I'm just like, because like the inner side of me is just like, what, mm -hmm. what you want? And I'm just like, or you could just like talk it out. Yeah, you could right. just you know, 
articulate your emotions and and, yeah. and and try to have an intellectual conversation as to why what they're doing right. or you're doing is upsetting someone you can leave your ego at the door and go do i really want do i have to have to pay a fine and go to jail and then defend myself as self-defense in a court of law right. because i want to be tough or prove prove myself or because i'm insecure, insecure about something or right. i can go yeah sorry about that man my yeah, fault right turn around and walk away sure and it's it's so easy to put into words when you're not in a situation like sure. that but when like all of the cortisol and norepinephrine mm-hmm. running mm-hmm. through your body and and in and, and your basic instinct and reactions to go right i'm a tough guy i'm a, I'm a silver back with yeah and then I'm just like delusions. I'm like that jujitsu will burn away. I'm like I'm like you know how to throw maybe three three punch combos. Yeah, in a street fight against someone who's yeah. just throwing Absolutely. haymakers, I can maybe get in there, clip his jaw, sure. and then what? But here's the greatest thing about this whole situation <laughs> because I I do the same thing. Tell me, tell me the truth. I do the same Rip thing. Me I think like with the writer thing, like. I walked around and I'm thinking like, I'm a writer, I have some skills and I've written some shit before. But if I was going to be object- objective about it and look at this person here and go like, well, what's he do with his time and stuff? It ain't writing, you know? So then that then he's not a writer. The same with, well, I'm a silverback. I could give a couple punches in. Maybe you could, but... Or you could get clipped and be asleep on the curb, boy. Absolutely. But here's the best part about this is that you can become a silverback. You can become a high level boxer or whatever. Like it, it's possible. You just have to put the time in. You have to put the effort in. But until then, you can't. You don't want to walk around with those delusions because delusions are like mold, and they'll just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, it, it just dissolves. And then you wake up one day, you have a rebel flag flying from your truck, <laughs> yeah. and you only yeah. watch Fox News, yes. and you can't stand anybody who identifies yeah. as yeah. a Democrat or right. a liberal, and. And then you're so tied to your ideology yes. in this little box it holds you your in delusions. that you can't understand logic yes. or scientific fact. <laughs> and that absolutism or fundamentalist idea or ideology, it just it negates That's so much so, progress. So detailed. <laughs> it's it's so bad. But it, but I just love the hope that's behind that. Like it's it's just like almost a little bit of grace and mercy towards the uh, egotistical dumbass that we all really are inside. That yep, you're a dumbass. You think I'm you think yeah, you think you're you think you're this hot shit, and you're really not. But guess what? I'm gonna give you a chance to be one. It's just gonna cost you a little bit of hard work, of years of dedication, of pursuing this one thing you know your buddies are going to go out and drink at the bars but no you got to stay home and you have to write or you have to paint or you have to do these tutorials or you make that phone call you can't go out very late you can hang out with them but you got to get back because tomorrow there's a conference call and it could be the biggest conference call of your life it's it's like fate or life or whatever you want to call that character giving you a chance even in the midst of your delusion and your egotistical I don't know, bullshit, whatever you want to call it. But it's giving you a chance. It's saying, there, that's cool. You want to be that? You can. You're not, but you can. I love that. I love that part. Self-honesty. Yeah, self-honesty. You to break yourself down in the moment, detach. Mm-hmm. Just the other day, uh, we, we were having lunch with my mom, grandparents, Jeff and Cheryl. No, Jeff and Cheryl. Jeff and Daniel. And uh, Kelsey like told a story about me. Uh, taking a Greyhound bus at one point. Greyhound, we, I told him that Casey's getting ready to prep for the PCT. He's going to walk the Pacific Crest PCT, Pacific Crest Trail. Like he's going to, he's going to do really? that. Yeah, for like six months, he's going to go walk. Good God. 2018, yeah. Rest of 2017, he's going to work at Eagle Pitcher, pay off some student debt, save up a little money, kind of get balanced early 2017, move out of where he's living, move back with mom and dad for a month or two, gather a bunch of money walk the PCT early next spring to late summer. It's like six month, six month walk. Good. Anyway, so I, I bring this up and I said something about, he's just going to take a Greyhound from Joplin to Denver to see Hayden and Trevor, and then a Greyhound the rest of the way to the start of this trail. And where is that trail exactly? Uh, it, it ranges from California here. I got the, I got the internet. It ranges from like California all the way up to Canada. Good God. Yeah, don't it's forget, a very don't long... Your, don't forget your passport. Yeah. Here it is. Look how long this sucker is. 
Yeah, so it starts right there on the edge of Mexico. It goes up. That's all desert right there. San, How many San miles Francisco. is that? A couple thousand? Oh, yeah. Good. Great. I, did, I, have not, I have not heard this. Oh, really? No. There's quite a few I'm trails. There's There's two I can think of off the top of my head. Um, oh, God, look at that. Does it say is a long distance hiking and equestrian trail close? Nevada. Oh, there it is. Two thousand six hundred and fifty nine miles and ranges in elevation from just above sea level at Oregon, Washington border to thirteen thousand feet at Forester Pass in the Sierra Nevada. So it's there's all these sorts of walks and trails. This one I can think of, the PCT. People just walk this for a life changing event. There's also like the Appalachian Trail, mm -hmm. which is on the other side of the United yeah. States. There's one in um, Europe, like the Spanish Trail or something. It's uh, the movie The Way is based on it with um, Sheen. I think it's not Charlie. It's one of the Sheen brothers. Mm -hmm. Plays this guy who I think is Martin. Is it Martin? I think no, it's Martin. No, Martin's a, his son yeah. dies on the trail, and so then his father goes and finishes the trail. It's a great movie. Fantastic I've, movie. I've seen a trailer for that. It's called The before. Way. Yeah. And and then oh, I can't remember which one it was um, with Reese, Reese Witherspoon. What was that called? Oh, God. Legally Blonde? No, no. She did <laughs> She did a movie where she's like, I think it's called Walk. Which is, where she's actually a serious actor? She's going to. Actress? Wild. It's called Wild. Wild. And Wild, I believe, is the PCT. Uh, she She's. Yeah, she actually it doesn't say what it is, what trail, but she walked this trail. I'm pretty sure it's the PCT because Casey was telling me that now the Pacific Crest Trail, you have to buy a, like a pass. You have to have a pass to actually walk it because after that movie, they just got flooded with people wanting to walk it. Just thousands of people. So now they have like X amount of people who can walk it. Yeah, I mean, so. mo monetize it if you get a chance for sure. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's too much. I think it's like 20 bucks a pass, but there's just so many passes. So you have to be on the ball. You can't just be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to walk to PC2 today, you know. But anyway, so we we're talking about Greyhound buses. And there was a story where I met this guy. I can't think of his name. Still Facebook friends with him. A uh, gentleman from England who was here for church camp and I sat next to him on the bus and dude, the dude had gnarly BO like gnarly. And I'm talking to him and having a good time getting his backstory. Super, super sweet dude. It's, it's kind of cool for me. Like this kid from Kansas and I'm talking to a great Britain man and he's from England. It's and, crazy. Yeah. It just felt cool. It just felt like an explorer or something. Anyway, we ride for like six hours. I'm cultured now. I listen hours. to an accent. <laughs> yeah. We ride for like six hours or so and I'm like, all right, man, we, we ended up parting ways, but we, we became Facebook friends still. And I can't think of his fucking name, but he got off the bus and the BO was still there and I realized it was me. It was me who smelled bad, right? That's a parable right there. My exactly. Friend. But she tells this story, and I mean, I get super embarrassed. Like I feel it just bubble up. Like I'm like, <laughs> yeah, let's get on to the next thing. I'm like I don't want this to happen, and she doesn't pick up on my uh, <laughs> body language at all. You know, we were talking about it in bed. She's like, I didn't see anything. I'm like, you didn't see my evil eye, or like, do I have to point a figurative <laughs> gun at you? <laughs> you know, put my arms up in there. But she was sweet about it. But the point was, is that I go, no, no, don't, don't be don't be sad or don't be like offended or anything. It was the best part of my day. It was cause I got, I, I caught like a little squirrel inside my soul. and like, what is this? Why are you embarrassed? What is this? Why are you embarrassed? Like I get to like mess around with it because it doesn't happen often, but it was just a new squirrel. Like, I don't know why I'm calling it squirrel, but like I got to catch it and I got to ponder and go, why are you embarrassed about this? And it was like, ah, oh, well, because it's kind of embarrassing because you, you blame someone else. You thought you were so almighty and proper and, you know, you had the moral high ground or whatever you want to say, but actually it was you, you know, the virtue signal. It was a virtue. Yeah. It was a virtue signaling type thing. And, uh, it kind of speaks to what we were talking about earlier where you were saying like, Oh, old Caleb, you know, or younger Caleb with his big ego and loud and brash and everything. I, I, I dis take, I dislike what he thought of or his values. And it's like, well, yes, but you know, if you, uh, um, relate with him and you give him benefit of the doubt and have grace on him. Like you, you'll love him inside mm -hmm. of you. And that's kind of what I had to do to that Colton who was like yeah. bad BO on this bus thinking it's this foreigner, you know, or whatever. And then turns out that like, oh, I'm the one with the rotten heart, you know, I'm the one that's 
not kind. This guy was super kind to me. I'm the one being a bitch to him. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It was just interesting as you were talking about, you know, sifting through your soul and going like, what's worth, what's worth dedicating yourself to? What am I doing with my life? Why do I feel this way in traffic? Like you just constantly kind of have to sift through those things. You have to catch the squirrel, break it down. No, for for real though, you yeah. have to you have to say, why is this happening? Yeah, this emotion, this uncomfortable feeling, mm-hmm. whether it's anger or mm-hmm. fear or doubt or insecurity, mm-hmm. whatever name you want to give it, you have to you have to approach it, you have to face it, or it's just going to manifest itself into yeah. something worse. Right. And the longer you let it go, the longer it 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 just it becomes a monster in the closet yes. that you won't even go next to. And you might you keep doing it. You might keep uh, doing that action over and over. I might keep. Oh yeah. Theoretically going to have road rage. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, it, like it's going to be there. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunately it's got to the point where it's habitual. Right. And, but I can, I can take a lot of situations where I would get upset and instead just wave at someone and just say, Hope you have a good day or mm-hmm. crash and burn either way. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you, you, we, we play this game with ourselves where we're looking for like this sense of satisfaction, mm-hmm. the last word. And I hate that, that when I like wish someone a fiery death inside their <laughs> automobile, that I feel good about that. Right. I, I, I'm just like, Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a monster. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If they were to crash, I would feel bad. Absolutely. But, but at that moment, we're just seeking that little bit of yeah. self satisfaction. That that uh-huh. that just any salvageable oh, sense of ego or I, sense I of, think of sense one. of I I am a good driver yeah. and you you're being reckless dude. and I will tell you <laughs> and you will listen to right. Me. I'm don't. in control. Have, I guarantee you 100% of the time they don't know that I'm mad at them they don't give a Absolutely. shit if yeah. I'm mad at them and they go don't you have something better to do with mm-hmm. your attention mm-hmm. energy at time Absolutely. at least that's what I think they say yeah I'm sure they <laughs> I mean I, I get, bet you're dead on about they don't even know you exist you know you're just that car right I am there. a car that hopefully doesn't isn't texting and driving yes that's that's actually the moral of the story that's the moral of this podcast kids Dude, don't hilarious. text and drive I can yeah yeah <laughs> seriously I can uh, think of something absolutely so similar and and it kept happening and then I noticed it and I finally just wrote it down just like okay this keeps happening I need to write it down because I'm not quite sure what the hell it is but it was I would find pleasure in when someone in class would answer something wrong like (laughs) huge amount of pleasure like fuck uh, you know, you like, just sabotage you, yourself. You feel I don't know why I just felt so uh, engulfed in euphoric, conquering feeling. That's some leftover monkey shit, right there. It is. It was definitely leftover. But oh, they tripped in front of the in front of the bears. Mm-hmm. He's going down. Yeah. Until I wrote it down, More and I'm food like, aha! I wrote it down, and and the sense theoretically writing it down was like following the string down into my heart, and it was. You are insecure about what this class is. You don't know the material. And when someone else doesn't know the material, it makes you feel better because you don't put the amount of time that it takes to actually know this material. And it was like, oh, man. At least we'll get thrown in the pit together. Yeah, exactly. Like, you're not getting away from these bears either. Nope. <laughs> you think you are, but you're you not. You can outrun them maybe longer than some others. Mm-hmm. But at some point, you're going to get stoned. <laughs> and they're going to eat your ass they're first, gonna my friend. They're going to get stoned. You're going to trip on a stone there and they're going to catch you. They're going to eat your ass yeah. first while yeah. you're still breathing. Right. Okay. But back. It Not all, to get too dark. It all, <laughs> it all comes back to um, there's always a chance. I got a quote from Wes Davis somewhere, but there's always a chance of redemption at those points of deepest humility. You've just been humiliated. That's you're the at, foundation of narrative itself. Absolutely. You are broken down to the very bottom and you have a choice. You can either become bitter or. Or you have a choice to become redeemed, to be resurrected into something better. And that choice is always there for you. It's just make it. And sometimes people get the pride gets in the way. You can't make it because I have so much invested into this person that I am, this personality that I've developed. I'm I'm the tough guy. I'm the tough. I don't tap. I don't. All you got to do, 
here's the choice. And it's so easy. It's like, everyone's like, please choose it. We want you to choose it. We love you. All you got to do is choose that road of humility. And guess what? You get to be resurrected into something that's way more powerful, way more developed. And you're going to inspire generations throughout the lines, whether it's just friends watching you like, dude, Caleb overcame that. I think I can overcome what I'm doing, what I'm going through or children that you have in the future. Or, you know, if, uh, if uh, our little marketing thing does blow up people that watch our YouTube or listen to our podcast, like hopefully this is inspiring to them and go, listen, we have problems too. We're these two dudes who, you know, super athletic and, and we we're like funny as hell. We're the life of the party. And <laughs> we have every positive quality that <laughs> right. anyone should strive to attain. We got a full hand on this life. Uh, Except for a receding life. hairline. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the joker in our card deck. But no, but we are struggling with these things too. It, when we're trying to be honest about it, we're trying to grow. And hopefully that radiates out into this world, whether in this time or a hundred years from now, if these podcasts last or these recordings last. Exactly. And hopefully they inspire people to go, it's possible. And I'm not the only one that has ego problems. I'm not the only one that makes the wrong decision and goes and studies biology instead of doing filmmaking work or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can get back on the track. I'm going to show you. I'm going to get back on this track. And I'm going to show you that it's possible. You can go flying all over the place, but the tra the path is always there. And all you got to do is get back on it and walk. That's it. It's always, it's always there. Just get on it and walk. Live, Have the courage to walk. Live, live this period of your life in the montage stage mm -hmm. of the film. From problem awareness, mm -hmm. montage, yeah, oh, problem solved, absolutely, climax reached, right. resolution attained. Know that whatever situation that you're in, good or bad, in your life is temporary. The you will not, this will not continue for X amount of years. Nope. It feels like it is. It feels like eternity. If when you're in it, it feels like eternity, and that is something that the psychedelics, especially the stronger ones, can teach you, is because you are flipping out flying through space itself being ripped apart and you think this is going to be you the stoner that got two stoned they all have this story of going i'm going to be high forever they always i'm going to have to tell my mom that i'm high i'm going to have to tell my grandma that i'm just i'm high all the time <laughs> i'm never going to be able to come out this of this this is just me now but yeah ask casey casey's got a hilarious story about one of those casey's told casey's yeah. told me that exact where story. he goes like, i'm going to have to tell mom <laughs> <gonna> permanently <laughs> <hi."> <laughs> and he told me with such conviction i'm like i'm never doing that oh, ever dude, it's, it, was, it's, it was a chiba true wasn't it yeah it was Sweet. a place of it was a place Jeez. of height but uh, that can be reflected on just life. Just when I was in school and I was getting up drudging back to Pitt State, you know, like, oh, here we go again. Here we go again. It felt like forever. It felt I, California didn't exist. Whatever we did in downstream didn't exist. Uh, high school didn't exist. Nothing in my past existed. It no. was like, this is how it's always been. I'm just trapped in this. Oh, guess what? I'm doing next week. I'm doing the same thing. And the next week I'm doing the same thing. But it ends. And it and it, ha it means for good and bad. Like you could exactly. be having the time of your life. You better enjoy the shit out of that because it's going, it's not going to stay around forever. So really be thankful for the good times, really enjoy them, soak them up, get off your phone, look at the sunset, drink your glass of wine, look at your wife in the eyes, really love that moment because it's going to, it's fleeting and it's gone and you, and you never know when it will be gone. Dude, you pretty much, uh, the other night, uh, Tucker and I were having some heartfelt mm -hmm. time and, I had written something. It, it was, I guess it's just more of a uh, lamenting kind of. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's 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 not an essay. It's more. It's just, I I look at the hands of the clock. How the hour and the minute hands are so determined and just so deliberate and even mm -hmm. movement. They're very confident that they have an hour. They have a minute. But that second hand is just ticking away, constantly trying to attain something, correct? Mm -hmm. A moment. And it will never attain it because it will, when it does reach that moment, it's gone the next Anchor. moment. Mm. And that and that we, by realizing that each moment is fleeting, like I, I hate that, that cliche of take it all in mm -hmm. because then you're trying to focus on just sensory instead of how you feel. Mm-hmm. You have to kind of approach everything your 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 wife your your livelihood your passions what you like to do in your spare time you have to look at all that and understand mm -hmm. this is the most temporary thing 
that I will ever experience. Mm-hmm. Like, like, like it's here now. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, it could be gone tomorrow. I could be gone tomorrow. Everything that I know could shift at any moment. Right. And statistically, most of the time, tragedy and stuff, it, you know, it, it, it avoids us mm-hmm. until it doesn't. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's a very, it, it just, it makes you feel very, very small when you realize that whatever I do really doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And, and, and not to be nihilistic, not, not to say there's no reason to get out of bed in the morning, but you have to get to this place where you could give all the effort in the world. You could try, you could wake up, you could, you could be the Jocko Willink posting the four thirty AM every morning. He mm-hmm. wakes up and deadlifts. Cause he's a real man. Mm-hmm. Obviously mm-hmm. he really is, but you have to get to that place where, when you know all of it's temporary, you know that all the stuff that I'm working for could not come to fruition. All the people I'm trying to love could someday come to just look at me with disdain by no fault of my own, at least perceived at the time. And that everything I want, work for, fear, don't fear, ambition, whatever, it could not happen. Mm-hmm. But... Mm-hmm given the fact that I put the time in, in the moment, that I did what's right in the moment, you have to be okay with everything falling to shit. You have Mm. to be okay with uncertainty. Absolutely. And that's kind of my rebuttal to our last podcast where we (laughs) we, we dove into the world of uncertainty. (sighs) I've I've since refined my perspective on that and saying, if, if my day starts here and it ends here mm-hmm. and the easiest way to get from one to the other is a straight line. But as I'm going, I can affect this person's day in a better way. I can do something small right here for this person. I can, I can say something to this person that's handing me my fast food that who hasn't had in human interaction probably in hours. Right. He's just a person who hands me my food. Right. Without any expectation, without any agenda, with knowing that those people will never be able to reciprocate that. Sure. And that they might not even acknowledge it. Sure. But you felt empowered, you felt in the moment that was the right thing to do, then your my, my day is should be here, here to here. Right. It might not be the easiest. I I my ego might say, uh, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, you have to extinguish that. You, ha- I, I, I'm trying to chisel that down to a point where I do things without an agenda, mm-hmm. without any kind of reciprocation, knowing that there's a potential output of, hey, thanks. It it's simple, but to me, it's what everything is missing. I I would get complimented at times at Ultra Modern for being polite or being, you know, just going out of my way. And, Mm -hmm. and I always said, thank you, but I really don't want acknowledgement. This should be the expectation. Mm -hmm. No one should thank anyone for this behavior because everyone should be exuding this behavior at all times, but that's never going to happen. And you have to be okay with it never happening. Right. And when it does fantastic, when it doesn't, oh, well, right. But, that's why I love that commercial so much. I, I, I forget what brand it was, which, you know, usually the mark of a great commercial, but just that chain reaction of like yeah. nice events happening. Oh, yeah. Hold the door for someone. Someone lets someone in traffic. I could do that and inadvertently, unknowingly, there could be a kid watching the interaction. Mm-hmm. And then that kid does it at school and avoids a situation that would have got him bullied or her bullied. Or actually makes a friend or, mm-hmm. or makes a new kid, you know, feel welcome. And then that goes and mm-hmm. that goes and that goes down the dominoes. And you'll never know it. You'll never have the satisfaction of knowing that happened because sure. of an example you set. But you have to be okay with doing it anyway. Yeah, right. Make it your well, lifestyle. Make whether it it's a, in vain habit. or whether it's not. Right. It's the right thing to do. And, that, and I think that's... You know, despite religious affinities or ideologies, it's, you know, to me, it's just doing the things that I was raised to do, but understanding that 
most everyone else wasn't raised that way. Sure. Especially didn't have every specific situation that I, I grew up with. The, and, and vice versa. I don't know their lives. Mm-hmm. Maybe they have never had any kind of positive interaction with X. And maybe by doing something, I can then maybe reestablish a different ideology towards it or a different emotional reaction towards it. Right. Or it could be lost in translation sure. and never knowledge. Probably so. Probably, probably more often than that, mm-hmm. I'm sure. But that's not going to stop me from doing it. Right. And not only is that important as far as being kind, um, setting a good example, going out of your way to like downplay your triumphs to elevate someone else's it's also important and this is something i've been thinking about lately is to love and embrace the truth about what you're doing so often in the past i will i would feel uh i would have an idea of what something should be go this is how it should be and then i come in to interact with this thing and i go no 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 this is not it this is no, 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 it doesn't match my idea in my head. This is not it. And then, well, really, I'd be bamboozled by it and go, no, 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 this is really filmmaking. You're working for Netflix right now, and this is how things are made. You're, everyone's freaking out. The, the, the van that you're driving with all the film equipment doesn't have the right film equipment. Burnt down. 4 a.m. Yeah, burnt down. 4 a.m., you know, call, call times. You're getting food for people. Like, it didn't match up with what I thought it would be. And until I updated my perception and go, whoa, this is how it really is, then I fell in love with the truth. And the truth is, is that filmmaking is hard. Oh, it's yeah. early film uh, call times. It's late call times. It's fast turnarounds. It's things not working out. It's equipment breaking. It's dealing with people with egos or with agendas or um, uh, inspiring people that have neither, you know. It's all these things. And I go, whoa, that's the truth. So, for instance, your examples of, I think, you know, it should be like this. I think marriage should be like this. We'll never fight and we'll always get along. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. But so then when, you know, you do fight, because that's one thing you do. If you live with someone, you're going to br- brush up against one Conflict another. Is you go, inevitable. oh, it doesn't match my interpretation of marriage my marriage must be there must be something wrong this with is my not marriage what I see in the movie exactly but really it's the the truth behind it is you know every time we, we tussle or anything but I, i'd never stop loving her or whatever or yeah. we just disagree on that you know we don't we don't talk about it you know she has her thing she likes that netflix tv show i don't you know she watches it and i don't mind whatever i go in the other room and do my thing you know but it's just about loving the truth you must love the truth and until you love the truth, you're just going to love the lie. And the lie is something as another delusion that you've conjured up and you go, if it doesn't look like this, it's not real. And most of the time it should be backwards and it goes, okay, it doesn't look like this. So I must be wrong. You know, this is not right too, too often exactly. we're ego filled or whatever and go, no, I know what's right. This is the picture that I've always lived with and it's not reflecting the truth over there. And uncertainty well, is scary. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> it's just something we all have to deal with. It absolutely. Yeah. It's it's going. Ah, I don't have an ideology. Well, not having an ideology is an ideology. Yeah, isn't that funny? It's it's a catch twenty two that you can't avoid. And I think I mean at the end of the day, obviously we all know nobody can be perfect. Nobody is going to. Except Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Nobody, <laughs> Buddha. nobody is 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 going to have you know this divine enlightenment where right. it's I have the answers. Sure. So or does every situation perfectly? No, you know. no. And it's you have to learn that effort, mm-hmm. self awareness, and humble, humbling your ego, extinguishing it to a point because there there's still a need for the ego. The ego is never yeah. going to be obsolete. Yeah. It's why we do what we do. Yeah. Well, it's it's a driver. It's a motivation. You know. You have to you, learn. Yeah. You have to learn that when it you know when it's a curve, you have to you have to shift your weight with. Yeah. You have to yeah. have to understand what's going on. But I I feel it's noble to try. Mm-hmm. I feel there's a lot of nobility in in I guess stopping yourself and going being a little bitch again. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're getting upset at something that's completely outrageous mm -hmm. and, and innocuous and erroneous. And your entire thought process towards other people on this road, mm -hmm. like nobody knows yeah. that that's upsetting you. Yeah. They, they didn't wake up today, go time to fuck up Caleb's drive. <laughs> Maybe one guy. Probably one guy <laughs> with my picture of my card license plate. And he calls his friend at the DMV and goes, where's he at? And where's his he satellites work? link up. And then he's just on my ass the there entire is. way. It's the van again. And I digress. Anyway, it's. <laughs> It's understanding that other people shouldn't, you shouldn't just irrationally hate people for actions that one, they don't understand, offend you, mm -hmm. that two, they can't control, mm -hmm. three, mm -hmm. that you just need to just let go, yeah. let it go. Do you meditate at all? I actually meditated in Florida for about 40 minutes one morning. Wow. Uh, before that, the first like session. three or four months, not long enough. <laughs> no, I need a tank so bad. Yeah. Oh my god. I mean, why not just like ten minutes a day or something? No, I, yeah, I need more. You usually I meditate either after yoga or after oh, I've been. You've been going to yoga. I do yoga on my own. Oh okay. YouTube still, or something. I still uh, I know all the yoga moves that I can do and enjoy doing from my time. So like, you just kind of like make stuff. a routine and then just kind of go yeah. through it. Nice. Yeah, and it's cool. I could be more consistent with it. Uh, with being at home now mm -hmm. and being on my own schedule, I plan on doing much more uh, audio books in the background or just like after I read a chapter of mm -hmm. meditations or some sort of philosophy or, or psychology, so something that I can think of mm -hmm. and then try to apply it to what's what the squirrel running around, <laughs> yeah, the right. self-doubt or whatever it might right. be. But Reading it's is, just, is so essential. Whatever you're doing, make sure you at least have one book that you're turning away on. And that's the thing. You, you and I are, I feel pretty confident saying this, that we're often uh, praised for our intellect or mm -hmm. our, our ability to use the English language to des describe what we're feeling and what mm -hmm. we're thinking. And too often it's glorified and put in this pedestal and everyone's like, you have a big vocabulary. I'm like, I wasn't born with it. Yeah, right, right. Do you know how I attain this? Uh, effort. Yeah. It's reading. Uh-huh. It's understanding the context of yep. a word inside of this, mm -hmm. this bubble. And like, okay, well, I can use that. Whether active or passively, mm -hmm. it's anyone can do it. Yeah. It took a long time for me to understand that. So often I was like, they're just born with it. You know, you're just born with a talent. And then it wasn't until a little bit of school to where if you don't put effort into this, you're going to fail. You, you learn how have, to learn. You learn how to learn. Yeah. If, if there's one thing you should learn, it's learn how to learn. How you learn most effectively yes. and efficiently and in stressful situations, how you can mm -hmm. apply it and learn, you know, quickly in the fire of the mm -hmm. moment, you know, tossed, tossed to the fire and just say, you know, well, Whatever you put out, that's that's going to be your grade. Or yeah, yeah. you know, in, right. in this situation, you're going to have to talk down a kid who's angry and you know got pulled out of school today and all that stuff. I mean, yeah. it, it's one of the, like from Spring River, uh, the the buffet, and then to to working with the kids at mm -hmm. uh, uh, Spring River Mental Health. Right, right. And then you, you have I have my internship i have my job i have school i have different classes and teachers that i like and teachers that i don't agree with and teachers i'm just like really you're reading verbatim from a powerpoint yeah yeah about that but like i i pick up jargon i pick up different things from each of those little mm -hmm. little facets and little seasons of my life yeah and every day when i when i have a like there's a social uh, social situation that I come I come into, or uh, a person from a different socioeconomic class. Like I understand how to, I guess, define and refine refine is a better word refine that vocabulary down to that person that mm -hmm. I know that they understand what that means. Right. They understand what this means. I can I can articulate what I'm trying to get across to this person. Custom tailored vocab or communication. Yes, it's it, it's it's an extremely which is a good skill to have. It it's a needed trait if, yes. you're, if you're ever going to be leading anyone, right? Whether as a, as a business person, as a CEO, or when the subway you know breaks down, the lights mm -hmm. go out, and everyone right. starts panicking. Yeah. 
how are you going to talk? Are you going to start yelling? Are you going to be like, guys, this is what we need to do. Listen, if you can inspire confidence and calmness and, and fully Mm -hmm. articulate what they're trying to hear or something that's going to calm them down to keep them from doing something that skill I, to this day, I can't be more thankful that I, I have the awareness to do it. That's partly because how I was raised mm-hmm. in a respectful manner. There's a, there's a yes, sir, no, sir protocol. Mm-hmm. And then you, you deal with kids that are just angry at the world and you realize that they don't want to hear you say, calm down. They want to hear you say, I understand mm-hmm. that you're, uh, that, that you are upset what you're what you're telling me is extremely unfair you have to validate especially when they're in a compromised emotional state mm. it's and then when if, you know if someone's hysterical you, that that translates okay i just saw a wreck what happened mm. i i saw it you did you see the stop sign did you and, and that it's I'm kind of quoting the guy who was asking the other driver when I got T-boned. <laughs> yeah. uh, did you did you see the sign? And, and oh, no, I didn't see it. Yeah. He didn't say you missed the stop sign, right? Because that would probably, probably would have been bad. And that whole thing was trippy. But it it just goes back to the point of the guy who hit me from a different socioeconomic class, and I felt if he would have came to me and tried to apologize or validate what he did i felt like no matter what i could have either extinguished a a situation that could have got rocky or i could have made him feel in that moment a little less shitty about what he sure sure and granted i was not injured in the least bit which helped but i mean i just it's to me again that should be an expectation to have a vocabulary and have a social awareness where you can talk to people sure. of any class, any any background, of having a basic knowledge, fundamental knowledge of history, medicine, science, pop culture, this. That way you, you can walk into a bar that's filled with a country club member, a, a Navy veteran that has post-traumatic stress, a bunch of college frat boys, and and you know a a mourning widow Mm -hmm. and if any of them come to you with their own thoughts and opinions and just casual conversation you can enhance their day right just by acknowledging them being able to talk to talk in their language and and say oh well did you hear and then they go i'm not alone in this in this interest and it's and there's no better time than today with the internet to expose yourself to all those things podcasts uh that maybe interview a morning widow so you go oh that's interesting i get her worldview or a navy vet or any of that stuff it's it's the easiest time to be exposed uh, to the most amount of information i have which, to i have to share that i listened uh, thaddeus russell mm-hmm. he had a homosexual uh uh, porn star on his podcast that had and I saw it and it was just it wasn't a squirrel it was, it was just like this little bitty mouse in my head <laughs> when, when when I saw the word gay mm. and I was just like nah and then I thought I was like I bet his perspective sure is completely opposite of mine and I listened to it and there were some parts he got into detail and it was graphic. But you take it away and you're just like, he's a dude. Mm-hmm. Working a job, balancing a family, which is odd, but Strange. but however you make your money. And I and I was just like, if if I crossed that dude in the street yeah. or at a bar and he yeah. started telling me all this, for an instant would he look at my face and know that that I had that little mouse yeah. just going, whoa, yeah, or, right. or would he feel completely okay with, you know, going deeper in the conversation mm-hmm. despite, despite mm-hmm. his orientation, despite mm-hmm. what he's done. And I just thought about that in a broad sense, like, you know, a, a crypt or a blood comes mm-hmm. from out from prison. And it's just, I don't know. I just think everyone should be able to articulate to an, a certain extent, your emotional state 
your own ideology, whatever that may be, because everyone has one, despite not wanting one mm-hmm. myself. Anti fundamentalism, that's what I am. <laughs> and uh, too many people are are not taking advantage of all the information. Absolutely. No, no literally all the information is there. Free. All of it. For free. All of it. It's like, oh, I just want some of it. No, you get all of it. Yeah. Yeah. The good, the bad, the ugly, right. the the opposing, the encouraging, the echo chambers, the confirmation bias, the just the the strains of social media feeds going down and fake news and <laughs> wrong and it's. Yeah. Ju- I think Guy Ritchie said it best on Joe Rogan's podcast. You can't hate the player, you got to hate the game. You can't because you're in the game, and if you don't play the game, then what are you doing? Yeah. That's a good point. Pop culture might piss you off. Smile and say, well, I know what Miley Cyrus is doing now. If, <laughs> if my daughter yeah. asks or, you know. Sure, it's, sure. It's, you just, you have to understand that not everyone thinks like you. Right. And most of them don't give a fuck how you think. No, no. <laughs> but if there is one person that I give a fuck about who what they think, it's you, Caleb Clark. I value your perception of the world, your opinions on things, and you are one of my, if not my best friend. It's extremely mutual. Yes. I appreciate you coming on, dude. It's good talking. It's been ooh. two hours, 44 minutes. We, I get, I got to get ready to go. To, we got to hurry. To BJJ. But uh, yes, uh, we didn't really get to talk about much about what we're going to do. So I guess we'll just have to let actions speak louder than our words tune into our social media pages be looking for a uh, branded uh, branded experience Mm -hmm. on 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 the social media outlets both of us are kind of done with our previous engagements and we've had conversation about kind of where we want to go in the future and it's uh, a a mutual thing of of what we will will be soon pursuing so and you all get a front row seat yeah so so hang on and uh Watch us, watch us, mom. No hands, brother. Anyway, thank you for having me on. Absolutely, it was a pleasure. It's fun as always. Oh, I can't wait to listen to this one later. Tucker is coming on. Well, I believe Tucker's coming on this Saturday, and uh, the next week I'll be camping. So you'll have these two episodes to listen to, and then after that, we will get into maybe some professors at Pitt, or I have the uh, uh, dream interpreter or the Civil War reenactment guy. A couple of really, really cool people coming on. So. Anyway, thanks for listening to the Sci-Fi and Friends podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Like I said, next week camping, and then after that we'll get back to it. But two episodes this week. Enjoy it. Uh, Happy 4th of July, and we will see you soon. Peace. 787. 787, departure for 25-7. 25-7, thanks.